Thank you. Uh, welcome to the first 2024 meeting of the Boulder Housing Advisory Board. Um, I'm Michael Chasey, the chair of AB, and we'll start the meeting by calling to order and roll call. Um, Danny Teodoro, not present on Zoom or in person. Terry Palos, here. Uh, Julianne Ramsey, here. Philip Ogren, here. Karen Austin, here. Karen Clearman, here. Uh, our planning board liaison, Laura Kaplan, is going to zoom in, and I don't know if she's here yet. She's here. I'm here. Wonderful. Um, so we have one board me member absent, and we do have a forum. Um, we'll proceed with the meeting. Item number two on the agenda is to review the agenda. Uh, we'll be, a, after this, approving the minutes. We will have time for public participation in just a few minutes with three minutes of open comment. That's item number four. Item five is matters from the board. Uh, we're delighted to have Christopher Johnson, the comprehensive planning manager here tonight to review the uh, Boulder Valley Comprehensive uh, Plan 2025 update overview. And I think our specific interest is to see how that update might benefit uh, the production of more affordable housing in Boulder. Um, uh, that's item A under number five. Item B will have an update on the airport discussion from uh, Phil Ogren. Um, and then item C is we'll continue uh, to discuss uh, HAB issues to address in 2024. That will be based on a letter we drafted to the city council uh, last month, but did not send because council said they were not accepting uh, letters before their retreat. Uh, item number six is matters from staff. Um, Probably about 8.30, we'll have a meeting debrief and a tele calendar check, and we'll adjourn by uh, 9. Um, so, uh, December 13, 2023 minutes, you've all had a chance to review. Do we have a, any comment on that or a motion to approve? Thank you. Okay. A second? Uh, we have a second. All in favor for the minutes? Uh, unanimously approved. Um, we are ready for public presentation. I'll ask uh, Jay Signet, our uh, staff, <coughs> indispensable staff helper, <laughs> to review the rules of engagement. And then we will see if anybody is here to address us. Well, is anyone here? Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll go through the rules then. All right. See if that works. All right, so the city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. And part of this vision is supports the um, physical and emotional safety of pretty much everybody. Um, for more information, you can visit the website. Uh, and following examples are rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support the <laughs> that chair will uphold these during the meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation, obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. <laughs> And participants are required to sign up to speak using the name that they're commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted. That's it. Did, um, did we have members of the public who would like to comment? Lynn Siegel has raised her hand. Uh, Lynn, you have three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Hardly know what to talk about, um, except that everything is housing. Um, and it's just saying in the Denver Gazette that I just sent you property tax up 25%. Um, I can't emphasize enough 
Steve Pomerantz's letter to the editor, and I think I sent that to you yesterday. Um, and it, it it was just this last week. It's about impact fees. It's about jobs housing imbalance. It's about all the things that um, all the subsidies that are actually generating this um, crisis in housing and the and the Jared Polis policies that I think are counterintuitive. And what's what's really concerning is is this transit oriented oriented development um obsession with densifying there and how like you really got to read Steve Pomerantz's thing because it's very very detailed and explicit and really interesting and he's gone to so much trouble like if we ever lose him we've lost something like priceless um but the the in the interesting thing is you know the the more you the more housing that you put in whether it's low end housing or high end housing it's going to generate demand for services um and you know i don't know if you followed the 90 year old woman that was killed on a left hand turn issue on alpine and um broadway which is like a place I frequent nearby my place very often. And, you know, there's going to be people swarming, peds. That, you know, it's bad enough that all of this um, increased density generates more cars. It, and debatably within um, TODs, it still generates more people. And the more people you have, the more those people are going to intersect with cars like Virginia, 90 years old, <laughs> and just knocked off. So all I can say is please think about how these subsidies are affecting all this development and, and how that is really not in the common interest because all the services to take care of all these people are very costly. Open space is in big deficit. CU South is a disaster. You know, the Dark Horse development, Olive, the Millennium, you know, Boulder's not a subsidiary of done. Thank, thank you, Lynn. We appreciate your comments. And I think most of us have read the Steve Pomerantz uh, column. So, so thank you also for bringing that to our attention. Uh, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak? Okay, um, we can go right into the uh, item five then, which uh, again, the light to have Christopher Johnson here. It's a little background for anyone listening in. Um, I have made several recommendations last year that the council adopted uh, designed to increase the supply of affordable housing. And we had a very general discussion about how the Boulder Valley Comp Plan might help or hinder um, that process. And then we realized we really didn't know very much about the Boulder Valley Complex. <laughs> so Christopher uh, is going to fill us in on how it really works and what might uh, be coming up as the plan is updated every five years and that's coming up next year. So uh, thank you again for joining us and take it away. Can I jump in real quick? Oh, sure. So I carry this around with me everywhere. <laughs> Here's a physical copy of the comprehensive plan. Hold that up for the camera. So I'm going to pass this around so folks can take a look at it because it, it, it's definitely a much more tactile experience. Well, I'm well, still looking at it online. It just yeah. looks too overwhelming for me. Anyway, sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I also wanted to note that Danny Te Teodoro, our vice chair, has joined us. Thank you, Danny. Uh, well, let me let me just begin uh, quickly with an introduction. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Christopher Johnson. I'm the Comprehensive Planning Manager, so I, I sit within our Planning and Development Services Department, um, but obviously work very closely with Jay and the housing team, uh, Transportation and Mobility Department, um, uh, parks, uh, open space really, really um, in, intersect with, with most of, if not all of the various um, departments within the city. 
Um, my my background is uh, in planning and landscape architecture. I, I um, used to be in the private sector for a number of years and then worked for the city of Denver for five before coming here a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. I do have a few slides that I will uh, use tonight to just give you a very brief overview. And, and what I've prepared here, um, for the most part, is uh, is just that it's a very it's a very brief overview, and and certainly will not get into um, a ton of detail as to the uh, various specific aspects within the comprehensive plan, but hopefully we'll, I assume we'll have some time for a discussion after uh, after the slides and, and can get into a little bit more on the specifics. And certainly if there are things that you are interested in or have questions on that I don't have an answer to right away, um, we'll make note of that and, and I can follow up with additional information after the meeting. <clears throat> so let me just dive right in. <clears throat> so the, uh, the comprehensive plan, uh, in its current format uh, and really established this concept of the service area and the and the three different planning areas, which I'll touch on here shortly, that was initially established in 1977. So um, we are uh, very quickly approaching a 50 year anniversary for the company plan uh, as we know it. Uh, the most recent major update uh, was uh, was prepared back in 2015 and adopted in 2017. So that's actually the printed document that you see there. Uh, we did a what's called a minor update uh, at the five year mark. So in 2021, I think is when that was adopted most recently. And then here coming up in 2025, we will uh, launch the process for the next major update. Um, the comprehensive plan used to be updated um, more holistically every five years, and that, um, quite honestly, I think was a was a drain on staff and in the community in terms of having to revisit these these major community values and policies every five years. And so we've we've moved to a ten year time frame, but then there's that midpoint of a of a minor update every five years. Um, it essentially is the governing document that we use for the Boulder Valley. And so this actually includes recommendations on land use and um, sort of the, the future vision of these areas and establishes policies, both for areas that are within the city of Boulder, but then also the adjacent uh, lands that are in the jurisdiction of Boulder County, which makes this unique in that it is actually a jointly adopted document and, and vision. Um, it goes through a four body review process it's the city's planning board, the city council, and then the county's planning commission and board of county commissioners. So all four of those bodies ultimately have to adopt and approve the document um, in the same format. What were the four bodies? Sorry. Uh, the two two within the city are planning board and city council. And then within the county, it's the planning, planning commission and the board of county commissioners. Is it in that order? Do they get approval uh, or do they all? See? You know, it actually... They all have to adopt this same document. So sometimes there's a little bit of back and forth. You know, city council might make recommendations. I would have to go back to planning board, et cetera. And that same type of thing can happen at, um, on the county side. So we we do attempt to try to consolidate a lot of those. And, and there's often joint public hearings um, that include multiple bodies. So we can that some of that. Um, but ultimately, it, it really drives um, more of the, uh, quite honestly, I think more of the of the direction within the city. So the city really sort of owns that and owns the process. And it's it's the city's department that really takes the lead on developing this. So it's, um, does it have to be a unanimous consent? And have there been times where like one of the four bodies is like, no, I don't agree to that. And then what happens? <laughs> It's a lot of fun. It is, yeah, it is a process of finding consensus and coming to compromise on certain things. So yes, all four bodies do have to approve it. There doesn't have to be unanimous consent within each of those bodies, right? There can be dissenting voices, but yeah. ultimately all four of those do have to pass it. Okay, yep. thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the comprehensive plan really guides all of the long range planning decisions uh, within the city. There's various chapters within the comprehensive plan. They focus on general um, uh, things around growth, population growth, the city's growth, the built and natural environment, transportation, climate, housing, there's a specific chapter on housing. 
uh, community well-being and safety. So that gets into some of our um, safety and flood and resilience uh, types of aspects. And then it, in a more practical sense, once it's completed, the way we use it and the way that the city ultimately uses it um, is that it guides decisions on annexations, for example. So when areas are annexed into the city boundary, uh, code and zoning updates, which you all experienced here in the last couple of months, um, Development proposals need to be consistent with the with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. So any site review project that comes through, that's a more discretionary review. We use the comprehensive plan as part of that review process. Um, it really just shapes the built and natural environments within the Boulder Valley as a whole. <clears throat> the, uh, the service area or the planning areas um, that I mentioned earlier, this is the concept uh, that really kind of was a, that was established back in the in the seventies and really I think established Boulder as the unique place that it is today in terms of being very um, very discreet and intentional about the service area which is areas one and two so that's essentially area one is the city boundary itself we provide uh, urban services so water and sewer police fire etc. Uh, area two, which you can see kind of in that grayish uh, color on the edge of the city, those are areas that are within the county, within county jurisdiction, but they are adjacent to area one and are already eligible to be annexed into the city. So they currently do not receive city services for the most part. There's a couple oddballs there. But then if they were to be annexed in, then they would be provided city services. So areas one and two constitute what's called the service area. And then area three, um, which is primarily in Boulder County, there's a couple of very small areas that are area three that are technically within the city boundary. Um, but those are considered the rural preservation areas. So the green belt that we all know and understand. And, and um, you know, as you crest the hill on US 36 and come down into town, that whole open space and rural area that surrounds the city is within area three. Um, I will note that there is a small portion of Area 3, um, which you can see at the very northern, uh, let me see if I can find a little here or something like that. Let me see if that works. Can you see my cursor? No, you can't see my cursor anyway. Um, can maybe, point to it? Yeah, maybe you can just point to it on the screen. It's the little enough. green area at the north end of the city. It's called the Area 3 reserve. Yes, thank you, Jay. That's exactly right. Um, I appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, so that that is an area that back in the early 90s, 1993, I believe, um, the planning reserve is an area of area three that was identified by the city and the county as, as a location of possible urban expansion at some point in the future. So if the city were to were to expand and um, ultimately that area would conceivably change to area two and then be eligible to be annexed into the city, that's the one location that the city has and the county have identified as possible future um, expansion area. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, the other thing I'll just mention on that topic is that the, our department um, is coordinating with uh, a number of different departments, primarily those that provide our urban services. So this is transportation, um, stormwater and flood, wastewater, uh, uh, you know, uh, potable water, urban uh, fire protection and police and parks. Uh, we've started a process, it's something that's called the baseline urban services study. You don't need to get hung up on the name, but basically what it is, is it's a, it's a technical infrastructure study to understand the costs and the feasibility of potentially extending city services into that planning reserve. So if the city uh, were to expand into that area, we want to have some underlying data of what does that mean from an impact standpoint um, on, on city services. That and that process um, has been initiated. Uh, it will be completed before the end of the year, and then planning board and city council will have an opportunity to make some decisions about whether or not, in this next comprehensive plan update in 2025, do we consider expanding into that area? So that's um, that's a question to be answered at a future time. But we're just doing the background research right now. So is most of area three like open space? Is that owned by the city or are those like privately owned but there's like 
conservation easements on them? Or some of it is owned by the city. So some of it is uh, open space and mountain parks managed land. Uh, a lot of it is private land. Um, and it is, it does not, most of it does not contain a, a conservation easement per se. Um, but the, the comprehensive plan, uh, essentially, again, because it's jointly adopted by the county, when the county is evaluating development proposals or permits in those areas, they use the comprehensive plan to um, to basically highlight and identify, you know, is is the proposed development consistent with this rural preservation? So for the most part, it it remains rural because of the way that this document is, you know, is um, the the framework is established and then <laughs> adopted by both the city and the county. Thank you. Uh, Laura Kaplan has a question from the Zoom. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Christopher. Hi. Um, Hi Laura. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm sick or I would be there in person. I didn't want to get uh, my germs spread around. Um, so for area three, at least some of that is actually like private property with homes on it, right? Can you describe how much of it is developed, but developed in a rural character and not actually open space? Ooh, that's a great question. I do not have an answer off the top of my head as to how much of that is is privately owned. I mean, a lot of it is agricultural land privately owned agricultural land. Some of it does, you know, contain, contain homes and um, and some larger kind of estates and, and large lot um, residential development, that kind of thing. But yeah, off the top of my head, I don't actually know the, the percentage that's, you know, say owned by the city and managed as open space versus um, actually developed and held by private landowners. Okay. Are there well water out there? Uh, yes, it would all be on well water or individual, um, you know, systems. There might there might be a few neighborhoods out there that have a, a communal system, but but for the most part, yes, it's all it's all well water. Could you give a quick example of a annexation that occurred in the last? I don't know. Okay. Uh, there's, there's there's actually more than you might imagine. Uh, the, there is one that is currently, I think it's currently winding its way through city council. And Laura, you might be able to chime in on this, but um, 5691 South Boulder Road uh, is an area um, along Boulder Road that's out in area two, but it's adjacent to the city. Uh, there's a there's a state requirement that you have to meet what's called contiguity. So I won't get into the details, but you know you have to you can't kind of leapfrog into these areas. So you basically have to have one sixth of your boundary needs to be adjacent directly adjacent to the existing municipal boundary. So you have to be yeah you you've got to have that adjacency in order to um, annex in. But we. We, in our department, we process probably three or four or five annexations a year or something like that. Usually they're relatively small. Um, every so often they can be something upwards of, you know, two to five acres and include 10 units, 15 units, something like that. So they're, for the most part, they're they're fairly small. We can give into two examples. So Palo Parkway, remember going to visit that? So that yeah. was an annexation. Okay. Um, the Saddle Motel at the mouth of the canyon. Oh, that was so that was annexed yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. We'll have all the portable units there as well. Um, and the the, um, the uh, school district property and the yeah uh, the manufacturer right. yeah the manufactured housing um, that was an annexation as well. Generally, the annexations are for some small allotment of housing. Generally, they are the. The biggest one and the one you I mean, probably have heard about was CU South, which was done a couple of years ago. Um, and, um, you know, so every once in a while, they, they can sort of rise to the level of um, pretty significant uh, incorporation into the city. But for the most part, they're, they're fairly small. And, and can I just add on? So um, annexations are really a key part because remember when we talked about funding and where, how we get affordable housing in the city? Annexation is, is huge. It has been. So the whole holiday neighborhood, Northfield Common, a lot has been annexed over the years. And we have a requirement that 40 to 60% of all the residential units be permanently affordable. So that's so we're getting a lot of units that way. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that planning reserve is so important um, is because you know, Housing and Human Services owns 30 acres up there. Right. Um, and all the privately owned land, as it develops over time, would have to provide a high community benefit, 
which is largely the provision of affordable housing. And roughly how big an acreage is that planning reserve? Uh, it's about 500 acres in total, about 200 to 250 of that, about half of it is owned by the city. As Jay mentioned, 30 acres is owned by Housing and Human Services. Um, the majority of that is actually owned by the Parks Department and was purchased with uh, parks specific funding. So it's being, it's essentially being held for a future regional park. Um, and so there's, I'd say there's roughly 200 to 250 acres of potential developable area out there. Um, just again, sort of ballpark. We haven't gotten into a lot of detail on that yet. Laura, did you have another question? Yeah, I just wanted to um, add on to what Jay and Christopher were saying about annexations um, and just emphasize that point that one of the criteria for annexable land is that it has to have development potential, right? So if it's a, a large estate that has one house on it, in the annexation agreement, we would talk about, well, how much is it going to get subdivided and how many units of housing are going to be there and how much of that is affordable. And as Jay said, I think it's 40 to 60 percent, which is a, a lot bigger than when we do a typical development on land that's already in the city, where the requirement is 25 percent affordable housing. So um, I just wanted to highlight again the point that was made by staff that uh, annexations give us a, a much bigger community benefit in the form of not just housing, but affordable housing. Thanks, Laura. Any other questions quickly? I'll move on. Great. Um, let's see. Back here. Okay. Um, so the other primary component um, that we use uh, frequently in, in kind of our, our daily work that's within the comprehensive plan is the land use map. So the land use map <clears throat> describes what land uses the community wants to see into the future and, and also very often reflects existing conditions. So you can, um, you can see on the screen kind of the large yellow areas that is, uh, that's our low density residential uh, uh, land use category or land use designation. Um, for the most part, that's already what's out there. Um, and so that has remained pretty pretty constant, I think, for um, for the last several decades, along with you know some adjustments to allow for some more uh, internal neighborhood commercial activity, mixed use, and things like that. Um, it, it definitely guides a lot of our future land use and transportation planning. So the Transportation Mobility Department uses the future land use map and the projections, both the uh, population projections and the job projections that are produced as part of this. Um, they use those as they're you know, interpreting and planning ahead for and major capital improvements related to mobility networks and, and other things like that. Um, and this also guides a lot of decisions around changes to zoning and code updates. So I think that's the that's the nexus that you ran into a couple months ago uh, in the work that Carl Geiler was doing to update the code um, to allow for some additional density within some of our low density areas. Um, and I will speak to that here specifically in that each of each of those individual land use designations, um, you know, there's there's kind of broad categories of residential, industrial, commercial, mixed use, uh, et cetera. And then within that, there's a number, there's a range, and there's a number of different individual classifications. Uh, most of them have this kind of three-part uh, description. So they describe the characteristics of that land use generally, sort of what does it feel like, what does it look like, uh, the uses that would generally be allowed within there. And then some of them also include uh, a notation about the allowed density, uh, and it's usually expressed as a range, um, or might set, in some cases, might set up a maximum number. And I think this is where, in particular, with some of the zoning for affordable housing uh, code updates that were occurring and allowing for, say, a duplex or triplex in some of our single family neighborhoods, um, this is kind of where we are trying to understand have we already hit that six units per acre uh, sort of maximum? And we did. Uh, we, we basically are not allowed to make zoning changes or code changes that would be in conflict with this. So if we were to make a change that would ultimately allow for a higher density than six units per acre, 
the comp plan would have to be updated first in order to allow for that in the future. That's good. Oh, that's good. That's the big point. Yeah. 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 So the council has approved this new zoning. Correct. But it really can't be affected until this update will happen. Well, the way I understand it, I mean that all four bodies say, yeah, sure. Yeah, the way the way I understand it, and I, I, um, you know, I would I would definitely uh, uh, allow Carl to correct me if if he were here. But the way I understand the changes that were made, um, there are new allowances for those use types of duplex and triplex within um, within those zone districts, but some of the parameters around. Um, the size of the lot and when you when you could actually uh, have that use, the overall density doesn't actually change. And and the reason we had to you know make that sort of incremental improvement was because the the comprehensive plan was limiting us. We we are doing some additional um, research and and we're actually directed by council because they had very similar questions I think to all of you <clears throat> of. Um, you know, have have we actually hit that that six units per acre um, limitation? And and I want to clarify too, the six units per acre is um, is not necessarily what's on the ground, but what's allowed. So we need to just be cautious that we can't run afoul of that of that maximum um, within what's what's allowed within the zone uh, the zone districts. So if um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Actually, Is that it? does that answer your question? I don't know. I can add no, no for let's say uh, I owned a home in that area, and I'm like, hey, I want this to become a duplex. Mm -hmm. Um, it still hit that six BU barrier that could allow or disallow. It's um, that, and, the way that the way it's currently structured, I believe. And Jay, you may actually even know this too, but your lot would have to be large enough to allow for that duplex. Mm -hmm. And and because your lot size was large enough to allow the two units, you would not exceed that maximum. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It, it does. So there's lot um, size or mm -hmm. formula restrictions mm -hmm. and there's overall density restrictions. That's right. And what are the what are the chances that this could be changed next year? Well, it's a question of community values, and it certainly is on the table. I mean, I think that uh, one of you know one of the um, one of the values of doing a, a major update to the comprehensive plan is that really everything is is open. You know, the door is open on essentially everything that's in it, um, except maybe the you know the way the area one, two, and three are structured. There's some basic you know frameworks that that aren't going to change, but all of these policies are based on community engagement and the establishment of community values of, of, you know, really this is a representation of what does the city, what does the community want to be and want to look like over the next 10 years. And if there's a groundswell of support to say, we want to be able to have higher densities in certain parts of the city, that will ultimately get reflected within, you know, within the policies and the comprehensive plan. And would you say the process would be about as elaborate and intense as a TBAP two, a lot of public meetings? Uh, yeah, I'll get I'll get to that a little bit. It's yeah, it's a big it's a big effort. No, as you can imagine, it's a citywide effort. So, so I don't want I don't want to muck things up, but so no part of the master plan is uh, been uh, adopted mandatory, right? So it's advisory. The right. comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan. Well, it, it. I mean, it's advisory in terms of it. It sort of lives at that ten thousand foot level, and it doesn't get into the real details of of zoning. Zoning is really the regulatory tool that governs, yes. you know, setbacks and all these other kinds of things. Um, this stays at a very high level, and it establishes a vision. But it is it is an adopted plan, and. Oh yeah, it does have as a land use lawyer. That's what I'm saying. As a land use lawyer, it's a it's an advisory document, right? right. But I guess right. so. My question <laughs> is so, and this is <laughs> I don't want to put that. no, it's okay. That's <laughs> yeah. the right question. I think. No, so I guess so. The question is right. So there's a lot of ways to deal with this, <laughs> and, and 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 I guess that I would hope that as we explore the possibility of how we can handle this, right? So it's an advisory document. So for instance, if you codify the whole notion that we don't consider, you know, we distinguish um, certain types of uh, employee housing or locals housing to be 
um, uh, exempt density or whatever it is. You can do that and you can navigate around the master plan that way if you got a snap through the master plan. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can go outside of the, the you know, just directly modifying the master plan. So that, that's one of the things that, that just jumps out at me and I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. I just dealt with it for six hours before I got here in San Miguel County, which mm -hmm. on Zoom. But um, so I'm saying, I guess, <laughs> yeah. So, right? Okay. So, I mean, I think that's just, that's just a big thing to me is I would hope that we explore all the different possibilities in terms of how we can have the flexibility mm -hmm. to encourage, because, um, you know, if you just change, my, my problem with land use designations in a master plan is that they, they end up becoming de facto zoning, but they're not. They're not legally adopted. They're not, a lot of times, they're not even necessarily consistent with the zoning. And, and um, there always seems to be this tendency to put right. land use designations and master plans over zoning. But here's something that went through the whole legislative process, and here's something that absolutely did not, right? And so the confluence of those two, I just, you know, as we're going through this whole thing, I just say that that's just, so it's that's my comment. Sure. Um, I would really hope that we look at how we can blend those two and figure out the most effective way to uh, effect, effectuate a policy that everyone thinks is really important, which is we need to figure out um, how to use, how to make better use of the land that we have. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think there was more of those to be this is a guide, right? right? Rarely does anybody go to this and say, I mean, yes, as a matter of process, we say, oh, the land use designation under the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan on this corner is this, but really the zoning controls. Right. You know, and the zoning can be changed by planning board and council. And there's the ton, the, the real teeth are in the zoning. And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Can, right. can, I, can I jump in on that as, a, as the planning board liaison? <laughs> it's in the code that when we do a site review, which is where I touch this the most often, that the proposal has to be consistent with the goals and objectives of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, and it has to be consistent with the underlying land use designation as well as the zoning. And we cannot go in and change the zoning if it is not consistent with the underlying land use designation. So we do use this as a binding document. No, but we don't. We don't. So that's, <laughs> that's a standard that everybody uses for a master plan that doesn't say that doesn't raise it to the level of mandatory. This has gone up and down to the yeah. Colorado Supreme Court multiple, multiple times. And that's the whole notion is that there are a lot of ways that you can deal with consistency. And consistency yeah. is always, it's a it's a, a holistic notion, right? It's consistent with the master plan. So, And if you read, sorry, yeah. if you read, the language in here is, is very broad. Right. And, and very, you know, it, it's not detailed down to this many, you know, it, it's very broad. It's conceptual. And it's it's a it's a fine document. It's a fine document. <laughs> yeah, through about seven updates. That's it's a lot of fun. No, and, and I think that's what makes it a very good document and, and very effective, right? Is because it has that broad language. That's what the master plan should be. So I just but there's always that conflating notion, right? That you know somehow this has the force and effect of regulations. It's not. Right. Well, and, it does. It does. If the planning board uh, operates that way, or if city staff when they're putting proposals together for city council operate that way it ends up being binding in a in a way that's like it's almost like a law right yeah, but it's almost I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not i'm not trying to argue for that i'm just saying that like that seems like oh, a naive totally right. and, and that's why i'm bringing that up because that's the way it ends up getting effectuated a lot of times um I guess that's one thing I've just always had as a land use lawyer is it just it, it makes me crazy because like, <laughs> advisory document it says it everywhere and then people say, well, you can't do that because of master plan policy. But I'm like, here's five other master plan policies that it satisfies. And so if that's the case, yeah. right? I mean, we could go to the housing section of the, of the comp plan and it'll have a lot of language in there about, you know, the emphasis of, of you know, providing more housing, right? Well, those policies should weigh and balance when you're talking about, you know, general conform conformity or consistency, et cetera. So that's just the point that I bring up because I think, as we try to figure this out, especially because there's multiple cooks in the kitchen, right? It always makes it more challenging of dealt with, you know, joint master plans before and that's so I just to me, what I really hope to see is you know, we can we can make certain adjustments to the code that help um soften the adjustments we need to make to the comp plan, et cetera. And we can kind of, you know, achieve that goal in a bunch of different ways. So sure. that's just my point. So I don't know if this is the right time to ask the question, but um you talk about community values and 
And when, and when there's a situation where there's going to be an affordable housing project or a homeless shelter, very often the neighbors will say, well, I'm totally for it, but this is the wrong place. <laughs> and so the community values conflicts with the neighborhood wants. And so to what extent is there power in the Boulder Valley comp plan to create opportunities to facilitate affordable housing so that it um, takes the power out of the NIMBYism. Sure. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I think that there, um, well, so to clarify one thing is, uh, you know, the comprehensive plan is intended to be representative of the community's values, right? And and less so on individual property owners or or neighborhoods or whatever it may be, right? It's 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 really intended to be um, a guiding document for the community as a whole. There are ways, I, I would say, to your specific question about um, you know how might it be used to, um, you know, really I think uh, more forcefully sort of project those community values that affordable housing or or homeless services are important and should be located or be, be able to be located in lots of different locations within the city. Um, there, you know, that could be specifically written into uh, policy. So as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's a housing chapter, there's the built uh, environment chapter. So there's a number of different ways through the policies themselves that could really reinforce that value. Um, through the land use map, maybe less so, just because that is much more of a sort of broad designation, um, but making sure that those, types of uses would be described as being appropriate within certain land uses so that then the underlying zone and the regulatory component uh, could allow for those kinds of things. So I think there's a couple different mechanisms mechanisms we could look at um, to do that successfully. Thank you. So, good question. I would argue that um, wouldn't necessarily help because if people typically don't say, I don't want affordable housing. They say, I support affordable housing, but I'm concerned about the park. I'm right. concerned about all these other in external impacts, mm -hmm. um, traffic, or, you know, concerned about safety for their children, or they don't want renters in their neighborhood. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to sort of work on the yeah, 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 one. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like it's like the Constitution, you know, it gives you the guide. Right, right. You gotta right. figure it. It gives you the guide. Yeah. 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 So to that point, <laughs> I, I wonder, it's a, a, there is a really fascinating interpretation that I, I, I honestly have not heard before um, about the comp plan. So um, we have been using it as sort of this de facto regulatory structure. And I think it's because, oh, you, you moved ahead. Could you go back one? Yeah. I think it's because of <clears throat> that density intensity number. We're putting numbers in right. our comp plan. Right. So I'm just like, well, why are we specifying I don't have my readers on there. Yeah, I think that's a great question. The whole thing is because you want to set a vision and the whole notion is that's a strong part of the comp plan. So you want to be consistent with that vision. But so, you know, I mean, Larimer v. City of uh, uh, Larimer v. Condor, and the list goes on and on. I can give you all the different, you know, case law that we have regarding comp plans. Like comp plans are not mandatory, they're advisory documents, right? And it's it's a thing. And and I mean, I have a lot of friends that are planners and you know go back and forth on this for years, right? But but it's a, it's a thing where, to me, it's important. I, I think that uh, comp plans end up being much more powerful when you embrace that advisory nature of them, right? Because I mean, just the language that they're written, right? It should be more of this vision statement. It should be more of those things. So it's it's something obviously as you can tell, I feel pretty strongly about because the other part of that is. If you want to meet, so if you want to say, all right, this is always single family, um, we're not only going to, you know, we don't we don't want the state to be doing this, like you know, they were posturing last year, but we're going to be not only um uh allowing but even encouraging in certain areas for uh zoning to allow, you know, for for property owners to allow more density over there, right? To encourage that as as a means of trying to deal with the housing problem that we all have to deal with. Um Ultimately, to me, 
that's going to need to be done from a regulatory standpoint, not just from a master plan standpoint, right? Because if I'm if I'm the NIMBY and maybe I'm saying it's because of traffic or I saw a field mouse over there, whatever it is, right? If you're basing it off a master plan policy, I can challenge you and win, or much much more likely, right? So the the thing to me that's really important is the code overrides the master plan in terms of you know the hard slice to get things done. The master plans uh, articulate in the vision. And for something like what we're talking about doing and what, you know, statewide that everybody's talking about doing, to me, I think it, it's really going to presuppose putting a little bit of flexibility in the master plan and then codifying something that says, you know, and the big part of that too is because we don't want additional density to get in the hands of uh, developers who are like, well, I can, you know, I can really squeeze some dollar <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, the whole notion is that's where you save from a code. Like, so I've dealt with a lot of jurisdictions. Employee housing or local housing is not considered density, right? So you don't have to change the master plan because it's not density. I mean, I'll be here tomorrow, and and you know, we're putting up uh, twelve units for my clients' employees, right? Well, it's it's the density is not there, but it's not density. So that's one way to go about it. But the master plan's got great, good policy language and vision language regarding employee housing. So that's the balance for me that really helps. Okay. Um, Laura's got her hand up and I have some points of clarification I'd like to pursue. Laura? Thank you. I don't want to prolong it too much. I really appreciate this conversation because Danny, you're presenting a very different point of view from what this guidance that we have gotten from both planning staff and legal staff, you know, which is that the, the code, the Boulder Revised Code, says that we have to have um, consistency with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan Goals and Objectives, which that is very broad, and I don't know that a project has ever been denied on the idea that it's not consistent because, you know, everything's in there and there's lots of complexity and right. different things compete with other things. You could always make an argument that it is or is not consistent, um, and staff in the site review criteria update tried to make that a little bit more clear that no particular project is bound to every single goal or objective or policy in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that, that staff really do treat as, at least in my experience, they really do treat as binding is the land use designation, because that is also in the Boulder Revised Code that um, a project has to be consistent with the underlying land use designations. And that's one of the findings that we make every single site review. Is it or is it not consistent with the land use designation? So if this is not actually binding, I mean, I think staff do treat this as they will not create zoning unless it is consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan land use designation. At least that's my understanding. And I think that's what guided Carl in his analysis of how could zoning be tweaked is, is it still consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. So uh, this is really enlightening, I think. And Danny, I'd love to have a beer with you and talk about it more of, you know, why yeah. does staff treat it as binding if it's not really according to the case law and maybe get Hella in the conversation too. It's, it's, it's uh, we're splitting the hairs here. We, I think we get it. Yeah, I think, you know, because the plan <laughs> designation is the, the most, uh, the strongest articulation of that vision, right? So it, it, it is very important. So I don't want to say it's not very important. I absolutely agree. It's very important. I'm not, I'm not saying you just shrug it off, but I'm just saying, so sometimes some of my concern is that um, land use designations sometimes are, are held even above zoning and, and that can always be a problem, right? So to your, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm possibly more confused than I was because of me. <laughs> <laughs> Questions um, for clarification. Uh, what you just mentioned about um, this is mostly pertaining to the yellow part of the map. Mm -hmm. um, limitations on density and um, prescriptions for a lot in the configuration and size. Is that yep. actually in the code or is that in the comp plan or both? That uh, the the changes that Carl was working on and the, and the things that regulate how development occurs in those areas is within zoning, it's within the Boulder Revised Code. So that, that governs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what council did last year, I guess, trumps the, the comp plan or- Well, no, it was, was, it, it was still that, it, it was an incremental change that still is consistent with the way the comp plan is written. Mm -hmm. Now, if the comp plan is written differently, 
through this um, through this major update process, those codes could then be updated again to be more flexible, more broad. Okay, uh, Does that that's sense? where I was going. So yeah. there's still some value in updating or including some language about this in the update of the comp plan, and that mm -hmm. could allow council to further act sure. beyond what they did in 2023 and make it more feasible to to mm -hmm. higher density housing as the zones. Yeah, and I absolutely yeah. agree with that. Right, it's hand in hand, hand in glove. You know, you kind of move forward into that. This is such a gripping football job. <laughs> it's a wicked thing. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. so we have, we're talking about what we should be talking about. Uh, let me ask one more question, then we can keep going on. Yeah. And sure. I'm sure there'll be more questions. Sure. How many municipalities have both comp plans and zoning? And aren't there some municipalities like, I keep thinking about people talking about Houston, like, they have no zoning, and so it's so much easier to get stuff done, and they don't have housing issues. So, like, and maybe I'm making that up, or, no, but no, like, no, no, it's, it's true. It's true that uh, Houston does not uh, regulate zoning to you know to the degree that most places do. It's it's pretty much the wild west down there. Um, in in the state of Colorado, uh, I believe there's a statutory requirement. So the st there's state legislation that requires at least counties to have comprehensive plans. And I don't know if cities are required to, but cities of a certain size, I believe, are, yeah. or if they're within a metropolitan planning organization, as as we are. Um, so all the cities in the front range have comprehensive plans and are regulated through zoning. They're, they're there are some very very rural counties that don't that don't have zoning and there's just very minimal standards for you know minimum i think it's 50 acres or 30 acres you probably know that off the top of your head 30 acre minimum you know subdivision size things like that but um for the most part at least up and down the front range um and in most uh most more developed metropolitan areas there's a there's a guiding vision document and then there's there's the more regulatory legal zone uh zoning component thank you so I, I had a couple of questions earlier, and um, a lot of your discussion helped sort of like help me understand what I was thinking about. Um, and um, also this issue of of the um, land use map as being so like you started off by saying that this document is a it embodies values, and then and then you and then there's a, this land use map which is like you know, reflects community values. And to me, to me, that seems like just like an absurd statement of like, um, the community wants this parcel to be designated as, you know, this or that. And like, you know, as if the whole thing was just, you know, voted on or something, every, every decision that was made. Obviously people are sitting in a room somewhere making decisions and, and um, that's fine. I, I'm just, um, I'm just really like, I'll just, the comment is that I'm really curious to understand how the community process informs the land use map. And, sure. and then, and then, you know, like right. adjacent to that is like, how can we um, weigh in on what that land use map ought to look like in the yeah. new, in the update? Yeah. yeah. So, so broadly, uh, if I can think of a, you know, an example of how, you know, community values or community input might influence the way the land use map looks. Um, I will, I, let me land on, um, say, sort of the notion of, of um, transit oriented development and high frequency transit corridors and 15 minute neighborhoods. So if there's a community value around, we want to put people in locations where they have access to frequent transit, they don't have to drive a car all the time, um, they're going to have goods and services available to them, maybe possibly employment opportunities, all those kinds of things, then we as planners and really kind of our role is to interpret that that sort of broad, that broad vision, that community value into the more detailed land use map to identify okay, where are our high frequency transit corridors? Where are the major stations and stops along that? How can we then change or update the land use map to allow for higher intensity, mixed use businesses, those kinds of things uh, that are within walking distance of those transit station areas? And, and then also think about the sort of quality of life aspects. How do we get parks in there and access to the uh, multimodal path system and the network and that those kinds of things. So 
that's how we, you know, our, our group and, and really kind of the work with all the various departments um, would take some of those community values and then start to distill those and interpret those into the outcomes that you see on the land use map. Can I just add, is it, it might be helpful to think about, um, there's the difference between a zoning map and a land use map. So a zoning map, a lot of times it's, it's what's there now. Think of it that way. A land use map is what is the vision for the future? So that's why they're not always consistent. And then there's a process to change the zoning to be consistent with that future vision. Um, so like transit below Jared Park, so Boulder Junction, that's a great example. So the zoning was industrial, um, but the land use designation was for high density residential. I, I think I have that correct. Yeah. Um, and then, so we went through the process of changing the zoning to be consistent with the land use plan, but that that vision had has been there for decades, right? Right. Does that mm -hmm. help at all? Well, it's this is a super interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It goes back a long. Can I can I ask <laughs> uh, can I ask kind of a specific question along these lines? Like, how did the the um uh you know this this section six point two one that we've been talking about many times about the at the time of the ma airport master plan. Um, will consider uh, using a portion of it for housing. I don't remember the exact verbiage, but like, how did that get into the the comprehensive plan? City council or during the hearings said said we want that we in want that language in there. Okay, interesting. So that's a big part of it. The city council just gets together and says, "Here's things. Here's changes we want to make to the to the comprehensive plan." I, I would argue that Boulder is a little unique in that. Okay. I would say most comprehensive plans do not put in specific projects like that. Right. Um, or specific policies that they want to see implemented in the future. Um, it's a little weird, but yeah, and, and I I want to just build on that a little bit, and I think this gets to you know Daniel, maybe what you're kind of referencing to is that at least historically, the comprehensive plan within the city of Boulder has been um, very detailed, and 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 is used more more as a regulatory document than then maybe it's allowed to from a purely legal standpoint or or preferred to, um, you know, just from a general use standpoint. Um, so one of the, you know, I, I will say that one of the uh, one of the aspects that we as a, as a team are working on, you know, this year as we kind of ramp up and, and plan ahead for um, the, the update process is to uh, meet with all of our individual departments and better understand how they're using the document more on a daily basis um, and to understand what's working, what's not working. And my suspicion, and I, again, I haven't you know gone through this yet, but uh, my suspicion is that there is there is perhaps a little bit more detail than is useful in in the document. and it and it it ends up causing, some trouble sometimes. Like I, I think this conversation around uh, changes changes to zoning um, is, is one example where there was a little bit, you know, there was detail in the comp plan, which is important. You want to be able to really clearly communicate what the vision is, but it also got us into a little bit of a pickle in terms of, you know, city council and others are looking to make some changes, but we, we can't yet, right? Because there's there's inconsistency with the comp plan. Um, the other thing are some specific projects, you know, might come along and they might be great projects. They might be fully supported by the community. And yet there might be some policy or some other component within the comp plan that becomes a limiting factor. Um, so, it, you know, my sense is that this update process uh, coming forward in 2025 um, you know, really one of the things that I'm I'm thinking about is how can this document be simplified, not necessarily necessarily in terms of its content, but how can it be simplified so it's quite honestly more useful to staff and community members? Because I, I think for the most part, this document gets used by a very, very select, you know, group of people, either that um, are in the community that really just dig into this kind of thing and really kind of have the the educational understanding of like how to use it and then city staff um, at, a, at a very sort of granular level and then some of our our you know advisory boards and things like that um i would like to see more people have a connection to it and, and at least find use in it and and you know be be something that's more accessible to a larger number of people personally 
I think that's I think that's wonderful. That's a great year. I mean, you know, so it's the same notion. If you had too much policy statement in, in a code, well, how do you utilize that? Right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Right? So if I'm saying, well, here's what it says in the code, and you're like, but there's no nuts and bolts there, right? So it's the corollary of that is for a master plan. When it gets too particular like that, that's when you start getting into that sticky point, right? But the, in terms of, you know, you can have this beautiful articulation of what the vision is and the vision for the next 10 years or even longer. That's to me where, where it becomes a much more powerful document as a land use document and even more legally enforceable. So that's, sure. you know. Yeah. And we keep well, asking questions, you have more reasons. I've got just a couple more slides so that might go on. It might just kind of give a, let me just kind of get through a little bit of an overview and then I'll talk a little bit about just the process itself. I don't have a ton of details on the process just because we're, we're really just uh, initiating that um, conversation to kind of develop our strategy. But um, I did want to just bring up because I know this relationship between the comprehensive plan and zoning is, is a bit confusing, uh, quite not, even for people who work in this arena every day, it's confusing. Um, but the, so the Boulder Revised Code, that's what establishes our, our zoning and each zoning district um, legally regulates how your property can be, can be utilized. Um, there are these three different uh, components of our, the way our zoning code is structured. Uh, we call them modules. So there's use, form, and intensity. So the use obviously regulates what is allowed, what you can, you know, what you're allowed to have within the structure. The form is how, what, what the form of the structure uh, is, you know, how it's realized in three dimensions. So that creates your uh, setbacks, height limits, other things like that. And then intensity is the actual amount of stuff you can have in there. So whether that be a number of units per acre, or um, you've probably heard of FAR, floor area ratio. So that's the amount of square footage you can have within a building on a certain size of property. Um, to Laura's point and sort of the way that, you know, we we use this uh, and the way that our development review team uses it and code updates is that they, they do need to comply with the land use map and the land use designation. So when there's a site review or there's a proposed development that it comes uh, comes through and it includes a change in zoning or a change to the actual code itself, the underlying code itself, that must align with the comp plan policies and in particular those land use designations. So that's where that's where there can be a rub sometimes between um, you know what what might seem like a good idea but it's in conflict with some of these underlying community values. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, the city now has something that's called the Sustainability, Equity, and Resilience Framework, and that may be new terminology to a lot of you. Um, it's really more of an internal guiding document for the city as an organization itself. There are um, seven pillars or objectives within that SER framework, uh, environmentally sustainable, safe, economically vital, uh, responsibly governed, livable, accessible or connected, and then healthy and socially thriving. Uh, within each of those objectives, there's a number of goals um, that, uh, again, the, the, the work that we do as city staff on a daily basis is, is all in, you know, the aim of making progress on these very big kind of societal, uh, quite, quite frankly, um, uh, goals. So the SER framework is very much aspirational. It's, you know, probably will never achieve uh, and accomplish that fully, but it's something we're always driving toward um, uh, each day. Uh, that did not exist in 2015, the last time we, we did the comp plan update. And so uh, it's very likely that through through this next exercise, through this next update, um, some of those some of those kind of core uh, pillars of the city as a as an organization will will filter into the comprehensive plan, um, and then the comprehensive plan uh, informs a lot of these other underlying things that help guide the work that we do on a on a daily basis. Um, so that brings me to the next update. So as you saw the printed document from you know about 10 years ago, we don't know what the future holds, right? We don't know what the uh, ultimate outcome of, of the next comprehensive plan is gonna look like, um, but we have initiated uh, all of our initial 
research uh, and scoping of the project itself, like how, how will city staff actually execute this project, engage with the community? How are we gonna gather feedback from boards like you and, and others? Uh, and developing that strategy. Uh, we are um, scheduled to begin more formally with public engagement and, and really formally kick off the project in early 2025. Uh, I mentioned it's about a year and a half to two year process that for body approval takes, um, takes quite a bit of time. Uh, and uh, it does provide this opportunity for us to meaningfully incorporate that SER framework and other you know really major policy shifts that the world's a different place than it was in 2015. And so I, I think that um, the, the comp plan is, is really ripe for some pretty substantial updates. Um, and as I mentioned before, 2027 will be the 50 year anniversary. So we're kind of aiming towards that as a, um, a milestone. Uh, one thing that does uh, complicate the process just a little bit is that um, the city is moving to an even year election cycle. Um, so there, there will be elections either on the city or the county side or both um, over the next three years. So that's just something that we're kind of navigating um, in terms of how we how we strategize the the sequencing of this, the timing of it. Um, and who ultimately is, you know, going to have, um, uh, you know, um, the ability to weigh in on this and, and then go through that approval process. But this this diagram sort of shows the general, uh, you know, the general sort of sequence of events. This year is really um, some initial research and scoping of the project. Uh, community process will be probably like 15 months or so, kind of all the way through 2025 and into early 26. And then um, in 26, really just been taking that that information, taking that input, starting to actually then uh, translate that into the plan itself, um, and then going through the going through the adoption process in 2027, or possibly late 26. There's still some uh, uh, some questions around. So based on around. that, if we could get really far along to the end of 2026, and everybody's on board with what they think the Boulder Valley comp plan is going to be. And then there's an election and city council goes, no, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> that's conceivably, that's conceivably possible. Uh, that that's one thing that we're considering as far as our timeline and, okay. and how we sort of navigate that. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I would say also, uh, yeah, let's finish it then. You know, the other thing I, I will mention too is that we, um, the uh, the community process, right, is is that sort of twelve to fifteen month window or so through twenty five and early twenty six, and so that's really when the bulk of that establishment of community values, and that's really what sets the direction. The rest of 2026 and then through that adoption process is really just documentation of that. So um, most likely, I mean, the one good thing about elections, right, not everybody's up for election at once. So it's only a portion of the of the body. Um, and so at least half of half of council would would have been part of the process and would sort of understand that and, and have been part of those conversations. So um but it's a great point and definitely one that seems to come up every day. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? Yeah. So Mary, could you expedite it so that it's done and adopted boy, before the before the say that. <laughs> um we that question has been asked. We're exploring that as as an option. I think the one the one uh I won't even call it a hesitation, but the one consideration I think is that this is this is really important, and we don't want to shortchange it. We don't want to shortchange the community either, and we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to really to weigh in and has the time and space to do that. It's certainly possible that we could accelerate it, but that probably means we would have to narrow the scope and only make more surgical changes as opposed to more holistically, really really looking at it. So um, we're, we want to make sure we give it the time that it needs, but it's it's absolutely a consideration and we're, we'll are we be working through that this year. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think this is my last slide. So um, 
really what is your role kind of in this process? And, and I think this is a great opportunity here, just this first meeting for me to provide some information and to, you know, bring you up to speed sort of on, on this and what the process looks like. But then I would ask you to help us um, identify if there's any key research topics that you want us to be exploring, uh, you know, this year, are there, uh, you know, really uh, sort of specific housing issues that that you already know of that is a you know this is a wrench and it's in there and we got to get it out you know that kind of thing um and then actually once the process starts um uh, you know participating uh, in that in that engagement process how do we engage with a lot of your stakeholders around housing issues what's the best mechanism for us to connect with people um and then ultimately providing feedback to us as we get into the process and start to develop those draft policies and changes to the land use map that kind of thing um, and then participating in that adoption process as well but that's it thank you yeah happy to do it yeah uh, i have two questions comments um First one would be, there's a lot of innovation going on in the council now, mm -hmm. the policy level, and how can that be observed, tested, and integrated sure. into your product? Yeah, great. That's a great question. So a couple thoughts. We um, we have been uh, definitely tracking on a lot of the state land use uh, bills that are starting to be. A few have been introduced, but there's a couple that are still in the works. So we've we've certainly been um, engaged in that process to learn more about those and understand those and what effects they may or may not have, you know, on the city. Um, we uh, we just hired a, a great new staff member um, to help us with a lot of our research activities, and so she's already started to investigate on a number of different topics, um, some uh, best practices uh, research and other, you know, peer cities and other things like that. So we have a dedicated staff member that that is helping with all of our um, research efforts. And so that's that's another, you know, thing that we, sorry, who is that? we propose to do. Uh, her name is Tess Shorn. Um, she's a recent graduate from CU Denver. Um, and yeah, she's just, she's great. And she brings, she brings a great, um, academic uh you know brain to this and so her um her research and then just documenting uh you know the, the sources where she's working that information is, is really great so we we hope to you know be able to share a lot of those things as we we will ultimately um meet with planning board and with city council later in the year as we get uh you know closer to uh, a, a, a more fleshed out scope of work and schedule and strategy. And we'll be sharing some of that preliminary information at that time. Good. Love to meet your new members mm -hmm. sometime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my other question is either naive or obnoxious or both, but uh, when you talk about uh, measuring community values and input, mm -hmm. um, there's like two ways of looking at that. What would be the whole community and what's good for everybody in Boulder given the goals of the COP plan? express community values. And then the other is, well, like my neighbor, the way it is, yeah. um, you know, don't change anything. Right. Like how do you, and then both of those are valid viewpoints. Sure. How do you balance it when you're going through this process? Um, kind of an existential question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'll give you an example because I lived near Alpine Balsam here. <laughs> and, you know, I know, I went to all the meetings and there were a lot of people who were like, I don't want to think development mm -hmm. near my home, but sure it's what we probably will get. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm happy about it, but not many of my neighbors were. So it seems right. like community values prevail in that case. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I I do think, you know, for the most part, we um we as a department and and really I think as an organization, we we are we are focused on what those values are that are going to elevate the community as a whole. Um, Certainly, there are there are some constituencies um, that are mo more vocal than others, and we listen to them and, and you know try to make uh, try to respond as best as we can. There's also constituencies that are underrepresented and have been for decades. So um, you know those are really the voices that through our engagement strategy we really hope to tap into people that don't typically participate in these kinds of activities, um, people that don't have a voice, um, you know, and a seat at the table. Um, uh, you know, I, you probably are aware we have, you know, we have a dedicated communications and engagement department within the city. 
We have an embedded uh, engagement um, liaison who Vivian Castro Wardridge, who is part of that engagement department, but she sits within P and DS and specifically sort of sits within our comprehensive planning team. So she will be uh, very uh, critical to helping us develop um, and craft our engagement strategy so you can reach those, those people and those voices. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that um, elevating those voices and really capturing that and learning from that, that's something that doesn't happen very often in these city processes. So that could very well, you know, influence and, and make some changes in the way we ultimately land on, on certain policies. So we're not we're not focused on, um, you know, some of the some of the louder voices that we hear from typically, and, and really try to think about the community as a whole. For the essential answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, other questions for Christopher? Yes. Yeah. You did a really good job of explaining a very difficult, very difficult yeah. document and concept and a lot of history, and there's so much underlying, so many underlying things to this document since its beginning. I mean, we could spend days talking about it, but yeah. you did a good job explaining this. Mm -hmm. And when you have to be named Chris to understand the company, Chris <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> really, really good at um, a couple of things. Can you go back to yeah. real quick, just for the fun yeah, of it, because sure. we're talking about this thing that really governs our way of life in this town for the next yep. the, uh, the map that shows everyone there. <laughs> I mean, it really does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, the the um, we're really at area one and area three at this point, right? The gray area twos aren't significant enough, but no matter, and they're pretty well, you know, the annex the annexability of those are. Um, but all that green there came about by two things: people either selling to open space or the county downzoning their property to one house per 35 acres or whatever, and effectively having open space, mm -hmm. even though there are houses, there's very few of them. And, mm -hmm. and that is what we all love about this town, which is in this area, which is great. But what it does is it constricts supply and all we have is the yellow in the middle. And that's what drives the prices of everything up because it's so great to be here and there's nowhere to go. And, and we love that. But then prices go crazy because everybody loves it and it becomes a commodity and people pay more and more to be here. And then we're sitting around the room with a whole bunch of people trying to figure out how to make it more affordable. It's it's there's just a lot of conflicting goals, you know, that have come through this. But uh, but this right here is very unique because to turn any of that green into into white or yellow, whatever that color is, I'm using my eyesight. You, a lot of people have to approve it, you know, and that's rare. That's not. The, the idea, the intergovernment agreement between the county and the city, I don't know how many of those exist in other counties and cities. So mm -hmm. the county has tremendous influence and control over our growth. And that was done on purpose by the, the Paul Danishes and the, and the Ron Stewarts and those guys back in the day. It was done, this was this document was drafted and created who make it really hard <laughs> you know, to do anything substantial outside of Area 1, which is that that you know, the, the yellow area, which works for a lot of people and it's great for a lot of things, but it's not great for providing housing to everybody who wants it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. That's just intended or unintended consequence of this document. Yeah. And, you know, we all love it. I love driving through that green area. I think it's wonderful, but it makes everything in the white area really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a blind man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, that in, in part, you know, city council gave, um, you know, gave direction to our our team, our department to proceed with that urban services study for the planning. Yeah, that's good so deal. that 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 um, initiates what is a, a multi step process, but it at least it create it gives the baseline information. Right. And then ultimately. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, uh, but, you know, it ultimately gives uh planning board and city council an opportunity to say, as part of the next comp plan update, we want you to explore the planning reserve in, in a more robust way as potential expansion of the city. Um, there's a couple other things that happen, you know, sort of happen after that, that would, you know, more formalize that process, develop a plan for that, obviously understand the infrastructure impacts and the phasing and all of that. But ultimately at the end of the day, 
um, it is possible that uh, those four those four bodies could approve uh, an ex what would ultimately be the first city expansion in 50 years, so, aside from these incremental annexations. Um, but it would authorize that, and and it would then you know convert that area into area two, and then individual you know property owners could uh, conceivably come forward with annexations, but. That won't happen quickly, you know. But but it's um, it is it's 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 intentionally linked to this comprehensive plan process where we can gather input, and if there's you know if there's community value and, and support around moving into that area, or at least exploring moving into that area, um, I I don't see a lot of city council members kind of going the other way. Um, sure. if, that, if that's ultimately what what we find through this engagement process of, um, you know, we're, what we're trying to understand through the urban services study is, could we move in there, like physically and feasibly? Could we afford to extend city services, you know, water, sewer, et cetera, into that area? Those next steps in the process are more about should we move into that area? And sure. I think that, I that's that. the question for the community. I understand it. But on that note, just south of the planning reserve, there's a, a church on 28th and Iris. That's an annexation mm -hmm. deal, right? Yep. Is that still moving along? Uh, as far as I am aware, it is. Yes, I think the last the last I heard about that project, um, I think they're trying to work through some of the annexation agreement, um, you know, components. But I, so Margaret's project, right? yeah, yeah, 2801 J Road. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. As far as I know, it's still moving forward, but I, uh, I haven't actually heard anything in a little while. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a really good uh, one. There's some there's some really hard. Um, I think like utility extension issues there and just some other things. So it's a, it's a tough one. I my memory is correct. I think we did make a recommendation in 2023 encouraging the city to. Do the research on uh, this area two mm -hmm. to area three and mm -hmm. see what it would take. So it sounds yep. like some of that's happening. Some of that's moving forward. Yep. Yep. And I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking on a daunting task and, and mm -hmm. not, but certainly not trying to make it more more complicated. Yeah. But yes, yeah. right. and, and I really do appreciate the contemplative approach you're taking to it because I think that's what makes the comp plan. Even stronger, right? Yeah. When you have that contemplated for yeah. so appreciate that a lot. Uh, and it's for Jay. So, are they going to release a paperback version of that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the PDF. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I haven't studied the new legislative proposal related to housing, but some of those could potentially force any municipality's hands on some of the issues. Uh, conceivably, it could. Yeah, conceivably, if they were passed, there would be, you know, probably a. Uh, Two to three to four year kind of time horizon or something, um, you know, for cities to comply with those state laws. But it's um, there's some similarities to you know some of the bills that were introduced last year. Um, they they basically split a lot of those out into individual components as opposed to one giant you know, land use bill. So um, yeah. Any uh, further or last questions for <laughs> well, I have a comment. Uh, yeah. Um, when I look at this document, I immediately go to the housing section or the land use map, sure. and I see it. I just see it through that lens. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on here in the mm -hmm. in the plan. I, I assume Tab is similarly interested in having you present, and they they see the world through like the lens of mm -hmm. the land use and Parking and uh, <laughs> um, uh, speed, speed you know, intersections and whatnot, and um, yeah. um, so. Uh, but but maybe there's not something in the comprehensive plan that's quite as um, uh, pertains as much to transportation at, as like the land use map. And or um, there's, what, what's I'm just kind of curious. There is a related um, plan called the Transportation Master Plan or the TMP um, that that is pretty specific as to um, where future um, road improvements, um, uh, like multi-use path connections, um, those kinds of things. That that's a companion to the comp plan. It it, it does get updated on a slightly different schedule, but. Um, 
those two things talk to each other. And um, really, the, the comprehensive plan is intended to be a land use and transportation plan because those things, those two things are so integrally linked. Um, uh, but the map just the map doesn't show up, you know, sort of in there as, as part of that. And, and then just kind of a related thing. I, one, of the, one of the things I worry about, I live between US 36 and Foothills. So uh, and I commute up and down the bikeway on US 36. So I, I, I feel like I'm breathing a lot of air pollution. And uh, so I'm looking for the air quality section. And it's three sentences in a paragraph about this big. And um, so, so I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, that seems like a huge thing, right? Like wildfires and uh, we've had lots of smoke and then there's just lots of traffic. And I don't know if it's getting better. It seems like it's getting worse to me. Like there, there's the breathing along the bikeway is awful. And so yeah. like, what um, what does the comprehensive plan it, it just it just sort of just says, hey, this is what we'd like, but there's not really like much we can do or yeah, there's um there's I will, you know, I, I would say there's definitely more limited direction on some of those aspects. Um we do I I have a suspicion that um this uh this next go around understanding that um sustainability, equity, and resilience framework is, is going to kind of filter into this more so than it ever did before because it didn't exist before. Um, but my sense is there will be probably a more robust section on climate change and, and some of the impacts of that, and, and particularly as it relates to resiliency or um, nature-based climate solutions, tree canopy, you know, urban heat, highland effect, because we're, we're talking a lot about adding additional density com conceivably within the city and in particular around uh you know transit corridors and some of our more urban locations like boulder junction um but how do you balance that that urban development with the character that i think we all appreciate about boulder and the nature that that surrounds us but also infuses into the city with um boulder creek and and all the greenways and things like that so my sense is there's probably going to be more of that in this next iteration than there has been um, historically. So um, just we have better data, we have better science, and and you know we'll work closely with our climate department to get that information in there. We need more um, discussion of preserving the community character while building mm -hmm. that's fine. Right, exactly. And how, yeah, if, if if you're going to have higher density, how do you also balance that with the livability component of how do you, you know, create playgrounds for kids to play in? How do you create tree canopy and shade and, you know, places where people are going to actually feel comfortable in those, in those environments? Because there's a balance there, um, you know, you recognize it from an urban design standpoint, um, tall buildings, taller buildings in and of themselves are not that great to stand next to, but if it's a tall building that has activity and things happening on the ground floor and there's tree canopy and there's a comfortable walking space and, you know, a more designed environment, then it feels pretty good. You don't need a field trip to Copenhagen. Right. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. We'll put it on Jay's uh, budget tab. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Now we're in yeah. 15 minutes for 50 years of comp planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's hey, um, get some more food on the way. Next agenda item, but first, I'll you know, I'll right, right. Okay, I'm going to get second, so it'll be 20 seconds. Okay. Okay. So there's no tortillas, right? I didn't miss them. I, I don't know, man. I just said some nachos. That's a nacho bar. A nacho bar. Nacho bar. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Where'd you get that from, Tim? From Meeple Pete's? Oh, I used to I like pizza. I'll tell you a fascinating thing about the compound when Philip was asking about the math. It's like anyone can request a change to the land use yeah. designations. It's an open process. It could yeah. be the property owner, it could be a food. It's really interesting. And so we have to collect all that information and make a determination if it meets all the criteria to consider a change. What about just adding a new a new section? Like, like if I have some random thing that I mean, I could give you an example because I have lots of random things. But <laughs> uh, do people just come forward with like, hey, I, I have this value and this thing I want to do, and can we add it? I mean, obviously, city council did that, so can, but people can do that too. 
Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. to a degree, to right? a degree, it's not like here. Here's my paragraphs. Insert that in there. Right. Um, <laughs> no, the land use designation, the mapping is that's unique. Where right. someone can say, "I want this designation." Yeah, every five and years, change. we have an open call essentially for any property owner that wants to propose a change. It doesn't mean it'll get approved, but they can they can submit an application to propose a change. Question is, do you finish reading yet? Oh, no. <laughs> and, and Jay and Christopher, is that is that only during the update, or can they do that at any time? Is it only when it's open for update? Uh, yeah, it's only during the during the updates. I mean, you can also request a change as part of a you know as part of a site plan, right? Um, for a rezoning application, but but the the kind of community wide approach is is just during those updates. Okay. And yeah. during site review, they can request a change to zoning, but can they request a change to the land use map? I thought that that was only when the updates happened. Actually, a great question. Um, I know you can do it in Portland. It only costs you $30,000. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh. That's equitable. I, you know, Laura, I don't know the answer to that question. I will, I will ask Charles. Um, Real big scale. Yeah. Doesn't the land use map be to all the bodies? Yeah. So you can't do it on the site. I don't think. Yeah. It is possible. The land use map change it significantly changes from A to B to C, needs all four bodies to see. Um, last I checked. But can you actually you can do you can do in, you can do internal changes with the yes, certain with just the, if it's within the city and it's to come into compliance with a an area plan, mm -hmm. you can do that just within the city, but yeah, the larger kind of overarching changes that takes four bodies. Yeah. So even if it's smack in the middle of the city of Boulder, the county planning commission mm -hmm. and the LCC still have no, because usually there's an area plan, a smaller subset, which, which that, that will have guidance. So as long as you right. are changing the land use map to come into compliance with that underlying right. area plan, that that's allowed just at the city level. Right. But so the area plans are all city level only. They're correct. On. That's right. But so my experience is the, the county defers to the city on city issues, and the city will often defer to the county on county specific That's right. right. So you have a, if you have a proposed land use change, can you request that all four of the governing bodies consider it and approve it outside of the conflict? Or it's only like it's only during that time. If it's not during that time, you have to wait and ask for it. You got to wait until the next update. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that, that, five, that five, years, years. five year cycle. Yeah. Five years. Every five years, you should show up with your question. Yeah. yeah. Request. Yeah. Unless, you're, unless you're lucky enough to live in an area that's doing an area plan, and then, then you know, it's possible that that could change. Because we just, you know, for example, we just made some changes to the land use map around Boulder Junction as we made an amendment to that existing plan. And then we took those uh, comp plan land use map changes to city council at the end of the year. So it, it is possible. But that was inside the city, That's good. right? Yeah. yeah, sorry, what? Yeah, in inside. the city. That's right. Yeah. City yeah. yeah. control. Yeah. What's out of that? Four by. But that four body only meets, five only years. looks at it every five years. That's even different. Now it's, it's right. really well, 10 years. There's a five year update, but the big ones are 10 years. And so this right. is a big year. This is the biggest one. Yeah, this would be a big year. Yeah. All right. And what would happen is we try to update every five years, but it took like three years after the five years. So it was like, we're on the year eight by the time you get anything actually. Yeah. And so it's like, <laughs> let's push that out to 10 because we're not, it's not it's done. getting it done. Yeah. 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 I know. Christopher needs to go home. So okay. Christopher, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Third time. Thank you again. Um, next item on the agenda, yeah. item B, is the airport update. I did have a phone conversation with Laura Kaplan and Mulder about that. Thank you again. Thanks, This yeah. afternoon. And I understand Philip is going to um, update us on some pretty interesting news. Yeah. So um, uh, city staff is going to. Um, provide a report to city council in February. That's just a wrap up of the airport community conversation mm -hmm. with the community working group that I was the HAB liaison for. Laura was the planning board liaison. Ryan Schuhard was the TAB 
um, liaison for. And um, there's, it's just going to be like, a, you know, here's what we learned. Um, there's no, no public discussion, no action items, just a kind of a, a re informational report. Um, but simultaneously, they're also producing research on um, feasibility of shutting down the airport. And there's uh, that that's going to be presented in March at a to be determined date. Um, and uh, the kind of three main things are um, <laughs> the the legal aspects of it. You know what what um, from the lawyers' perspectives, what what's it going to take to challenge this in, in the court system? Um, there's the economic considerations. Uh, how much, if we stop taking money from the FAA, how much, um, uh, what's it gonna cost Boulder to um, run the airport without FAA grant money? Um, I don't know if that also includes um, uh, considerations around the economic feasibility around <clears throat> the market value of the, the land and how that would affect the housing development uh, plans that you might create. Um, and then they're also looking into the FAA response that, you know, they're engaging with the FAA and getting um, responses from them. I, I haven't heard anything about what that might be, except from what we learned before was just, you know, um, some guy named John uh, in Denver was like... <laughs> John Denver. Yeah. 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 yeah, he was a hard, he was a hard pass. Uh, but yeah. so I'm not, I'm not sure how that engagement's going. But I, I, what I understand is we're going to find out about it. So, um, uh, so there'll be a, there'll be a hearing. Um, and so then, um, uh, city staff will be asking uh, council for direction on again uh, whether to accept more grant money. Um, whether to um, consider a housing option and um, adjacent to that is that has, you know, like, should we develop a housing plan? Um, should we shut down the whole housing thing and just focus on uh, the airport master plan and expand and improve? Um, and then, and then there's this, there's this ongoing thing about unleaded fuel. Um, can we bring unleaded fuel to, um, to the airport? So, um, those are kind of the main four things. Um, so how do you feel if we have to do it? it is, we don't allow it right now, or what? Or we're asking for it, then we'll do it. I don't get the unlimited fuel thing just as a side chain. Okay. Well, um, the, right now there's leaded fuel at sure. the airport. And um, we want to get rid of it. We want to get rid of it. Yeah. That's part of this discussion. That's part of this discussion. Got it. Yeah. Got That's it. if we keep the airport in commission. Whether or not, actually, because, you know, the lighted fuel is being burnt in the skies right now, and people who are living under it don't want it between now and whenever a housing plan goes into effect. So that's the predominant fuel for aviation. Yeah, especially those hobbyist type planes. Really? Okay. Interesting. I don't know. I live um, under the airport. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go back to the internships. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There has, there, has been some, <laughs> there has been some buzz about uh, the possibility, and this is just sort of from the rumor mill, I think, uh, but some some buzz about the possibility of a ballot measure or uh, considering shutting down the airport if, if city council feels like it's like um, the democratic way is to is to vote on. So that, that's, mm. that's a possibility. Um, and that would be when? Like next, like next, this November? Uh, that's a good question. I, mm -hmm. I, I would assume so that, that, okay. you know, that was going to get put together. Um, I, I think, um, a ballot, I, it's possible that the city council could, could put a ballot measure on if they don't, if they feel like it's, um, something they want people to vote on, but there's also some grassroots efforts that might be willing to step in and signatures. And get the signatures for petition. Um, so there's also yeah. There's, so there's also um, right now there's there's a, a grassroots effort from some neighborhood activists um, who are putting together a petition for uh, the March meeting. So it's not a it's not an official city of Boulder uh, petition, but it's um it's a like a a, a show of support petition to say. This many people responded to our petition, and we're giving you this feedback in advance of this March meeting when all of these um, 
this all this discussion in two directions is going to be discussed. So um, that's that's um, live right now. Um, there's a there's a website called Boulder Airport Petition .net. So um, some some uh, fine uh, activists have been putting together a website and they've, they've got a form to, that you can fill out. So, anyways, uh, that's that's of interest. Um, I think that's all I've got for the airport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, yeah. Wow. Well, um, well, I can forward this to everyone who will probably come your way anyway, but the header on the petition is, let's turn the Boulder Airport site into one of the best places to live, work, and play in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> that's pretty, that's a pretty, couple hundred million bucks. That's right. <laughs> well, we're not going to... Uh, we don't have any voting items. No problem, do it. I feel like in February we should weigh in on this. I'm sorry? In February, have should weigh in on this in advance of this March meeting. So we've talked about this at length, so I don't think I need to elaborate. Would it be in the form of a letter? I think it would be a formal recommendation, possibly. I think we haven't discussed it or voted on it, possibly to say, please be clear. Housing up, you know. So wait, are we going to have a have meeting before the before that next meeting? Or um, we need to be drafting something now. There, I I don't know. I the there's two meetings. One is the February report about the community conversation. Okay. We don't need to have something in advance of that. Okay. But, the, but the other one will be in March, at a date to be determined. Yeah. Road, yeah right? So it could it could be a bit later than March, but um, um so I think definitely we'll have a meeting. Before that March meeting. Okay. Yeah. I'd be supportive of us writing a letter. The recommendation is a letter I got. Sure. I would I would like to see what comes out in the studies too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 before we send a letter. What comes out in your studies, the feasibility oh, yeah. studies and stuff. Do you want pretty... data before you make a decision? No. <laughs> Alternative facts? Which, uh, which, which aspect are you most concerned about? The economic or the legal or the FAA? Uh, well, the legal, for sure. I mean, so yeah. you know, one of the things that always concerns is everyone's like, well, just, you know, just sue the agreement. Just right? right? And then you litigate for three years and then you lose. And then where does it lead you? Well, you know, Chevron right. difference is going away. Oh, uh, what? Uh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of barely related, but actually could be very related. <laughs> Chevron deference is this big thing going on in the U.S. Supreme Court right now, which is going to um, kind of uh, create a lot of upheaval in the regulatory framework. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's... I hear you, you're right. It's busy. I got some big decisions to make. It really scares me now. New course busy too, but uh, yeah. I mean, I just like to see some of that stuff and just see uh, kind of how that all breaks down. Because I mean, I think I think it's it's really really right. Uh, Laura has her uh, hand up. Yeah, I just want to say um, I agree with Danny. It would be ideal to see staffs feasibility research before you have to weigh it. Unfortunately, yeah. I think there's a timing issue here where at least according to staff, they're going to present the research for this March meeting and ask city council for direction at the same time. And oh, it's a little yeah. unpredictable what the city council will do at that March meeting. So I don't I don't know. I mean, they'll probably have a memo in the city council packet that explains some of that research, but you'll just get that about a week before the decision could be made. Okay. So it's possible that nothing will happen at that March meeting, that no decision will be made, but it, it's not a guarantee. So the March meeting might give some solid direction on either pursue the housing plan or shut the door on housing and do an airport master plan or it could be anything else so you know i would recommend that if you want to weigh in and say please keep the housing option open this is a good time to do it i think ideally you'd be able to wait and see the research first but i just don't know if that timing is going to work out um when you say this is a good time to you mean now as opposed to next meeting I just mean um, before the March meeting, right? Because okay, I, yeah. I, I don't think you have time to wait and see the research and then write a letter, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, no, I think we need a, we need a unless, unless we sit, we go to city council uh, chambers together. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, some research is good. So just in terms of timing, that council meeting is likely to be 
after the next tab meeting or do we so do we have it? Have it is. Michael, can I interject? So sure, nothing please. has been scheduled with council. It's nothing. not on the calendar. Oh. So I would temper your expectations for February and March. Okay. Oh, so maybe it's a sense of urgency is not gonna have something to be backed on in February or March. But I will you let time. us know it's when possible. it's on there? I will let you know if it yeah. if it appears, but um usually council doesn't like it when staff just Puts things on the agenda last minute. So, <laughs> so Jay, you're saying it could get deferred? I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Yeah. Last time I talked with Natalie Stifler, who's the director of transportation, and given this was many weeks ago that I spoke with her, probably about three weeks ago, she said they were aiming for March, but you know that could get pushed back. Yep. Well, this is a complex <laughs> issue that I personally was looking having a little time to. <laughs> See what happens. Yeah, so let's just make make a point of it. We'll, you know, kind of have a block of time for this in February. And... Um, okay, anything else on the airport before we move to our next agenda item under matters from the board? Nope. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, uh, Okay, we're moving on to item C then, which is scoping of cab issues continued. We had a great conversation about this in December. At that time, we thought we were going to be submitting a letter to council. So that spurred us to draft a letter, which um, <laughs> turns out council did not, did not request. <laughs> However, it's you know, a very useful exercise in framing our thoughts for what we want to be doing this year, what's important. And um, if you follow the outline of the draft that you've all seen and some of you commented on there were three areas we wanted to consider um one is a continuation of of our focus on missing middle but with i'd say more detail um some of them we heard tonight in, in discussing the comp plan update and the airport uh the planning reserve and then we also threw in talking about uh linkage fees and parking requirements um and then we had item two about uh just creating more affordable housing in general this is really pretty conceptual but the, the idea being it's really expensive to build housing in boulder uh any kind of housing um and how can we uh think about ways of bringing the cost down um either using sur surplus properties uh more mixed use developments uh, mining parking lots we have a number of acres of underused parking lots in our city and that's more of an area of discussion i don't think it's anything uh, we'd be making a recommendation on right away uh but it'd be kind of interesting to uh, come up with some substantial thoughts on those issues and present them to council in ways that maybe they haven't thought about before. Um, kind of gets to the, the root of who we are. Are we strictly an advisory board uh, making recommendations to the council's request or are we innovators who are coming up with their own ideas and passing them on? Um, kind of made with the latter category myself. And then uh, item three is an area that we have not waded into in the time I've been on, um, and that's really getting into um, ways of increasing the supply of transitional housing for the unhoused. I'm looking at certain uh, opportunities. I know council's talking about some of these things and maybe not others. <clears throat> Adaptive use of office buildings is a real surplus, uh, or I say, should say a, a large supply of vacant uh, commercial properties in Boulder right now. Um, transitional uh, solutions uh, to encampments um, and even tiny home villages, uh, you know, uh, kind of kind of matching what that might look like and where they go. Some of this, I think we have a benefit of Denver sort of experimenting with a lot of these things right now under new mayor Mike Johnson, but I'm really, really curious to see how some of them come out. This is, um, a fraught area. Uh, I think, like most who wade into the conversation, get hung up on deeply emotional, controversial uh, points that you know forestall rather than lead to progress on this issue. And my personal goal would be to avoid that kind of 
uh, I call it a trap and uh, say, let's really just focus on housing and not get into issues like policing and how you deal with drug addiction and things that we have, at least I have personally have no expertise in. But um, it's really up to us to just discuss this and say, I don't want to touch it, or I would like to investigate it further and could possibly lead to some recommendations. That was, that's really the purpose of going over this letter. So I will stop talking. I have a comment about the transitional housing. So I spoke with um, Mike Block, who's the executive director, CEO of the shelter yesterday. And I asked him about like safe camping and pallet homes. And he, his position is that those solutions suck money away from housing and that he is supportive of tiny homes or tiny villages because actually there's now some evidence that you can get vouchers for tiny homes. Oh, really? But you cannot get any sort of voucher for like the sanctioned camping, sanctioned parking, and some of the concepts of pallet homes. So his thinking is if it's going to cost millions of dollars, because we saw some analysis, I think that the city did about the costs associated with creating some safe camping, safe parking kinds of things is like millions of dollars. And that is siphoning money away from permanent housing solutions like Bluebird or or some sort of tiny village. So I think my position has changed based on that. And we as a group should not think about transitional housing, but we should absolutely think about are there ways of creating units that don't cost seven hundred thousand dollars a door. Mm -hmm. That's a really so, great point. And I'm following the Denver called the experiment pretty closely. And um, those seem to be getting people off the streets. You know, whether those, uh, say, sanctioned encampments work, I think there's a theory out on that. And then if you look at the costs, it's staggering. It's, it is going to just be money down the drain. So I think we need to keep an eye on issues like that. Terry, it's, it's, it's just a side note. Houston, we're talking about Houston. The Denver homeless plan that Mike Johnson is doing mm -hmm. was taken from Houston. Yeah. Yeah. They did it. They started this idea of buying old motels and this and that, and, you know, multifamily, whatever, in, in Houston five, six, seven, eight years ago. And it's really worked. Yeah. It's really worked. And I think it's working in Denver. It's just very expensive to buy $20 million hotels with 200 rooms in them to, to yeah. get people off the streets. But, you know, the cost, I don't want to get into this, you know how I feel, but the cost, the alternative cost is way more. So it seems to be working. It seems yeah. to be working. My question, though, is, if, if we provide X, or not we, anyone, Houston, Denver, whatever, provides X amount of beds for homeless people, to go, what's to stop more homeless people from moving? You know what I mean? Like, is it endless? Does anybody know the answer to that? I'm curious about what the logistics of those motel, hotel programs are. Like, do they stay there for a week or a year? I don't like, know. I, don't know. I think it depends a lot on that, like how they get people moving afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I don't it's not permanent. I mean, it's, right. it, I think it's a fairly long transition, like a couple of years. Okay. Uh, but I have questions about logistics also. Like, how do you supervise those places? Uh, well, you just move people in and leave it, leave it be. It's, okay. So there's a cost there as well. The adult or a... See, in my, mind, <laughs> in my mind, I'd like to see those hotels be converted into permanent housing, right? Like, you, you got it. It's basically like a studio apartment and it's already got a bathroom. You know, you add some sort of kitchen or cooking facility. And then, yes, they're like the and 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 then the way for it to be successful is for there also to be supportive services associated with it. Yeah. So when I think about how do you best house people who are previously homeless, it's a three legged stool. It's like you need a unit. And you need a voucher to pay for their rent, and you need permanent supportive housing to help them transition and you know learn how to be in an apartment and get their medical care and get their mental health care. And so you need all three legs. So I would be very supportive of some of those hotels being permanent homes for people that you don't then transition them into something else, but you then 
given them a permanent place to live. Do we yes. have any of those? No, we don't. I, we don't, we don't have, have those. Those. We're not going to buy so those. So that's not a solution. Yeah. I'm just yeah. saying yeah. the demo right. model came from yeah. Houston and it seems to be working. But it could be in San Francisco but, too, sir. They did in San Francisco. I don't know that it worked as well. well they but it could be a so similar far. model if you took some of these office buildings, right? Like a lot of people will say you can't convert office buildings into apartments. It's not feasible. And I think that's true if you're looking at like traditional market rate apartments that are then competing with brand new yeah. apartment complexes. But maybe if you shift the the mindset and you turn it into sort of SRO so that each yeah each you each office ends up being a place to sleep and there's like a shared um bathroom facility and you create showers and there's like communal kitchens in the middle and there's permanent supportive housing that you're creating alternative housing formats to which are just better than People yeah, sleeping it's less in the tent. expensive to just sure. build something from scratch. 100%. From converting resident, you know, commercial code satisfying stuff to residential. Um, yes. Right. But uh, you, so you think you should just demolish them? Demolish it's less expensive to demolish them and demolish build. Whether demolish, but starting from scratch as opposed to converting mm -hmm. commercial to residential. It's expensive. To build than it is to convert. Crazy, right? Because but it may not be to demolish and then build. Well, well it depends on the up. land. What do we say here now? Let's, let's, I'm confused. If we take an empty office building, mm -hmm. which there's many of them right now, yeah. and we try to turn it into a bunch of apartments yeah. in any form or fashion, very expensive. it's very expensive, right? But my thought is instead of trying to turn them into a bunch of individual apartments, you take an office building that is a 10,000 square foot floor plate, right? And it has some bathrooms that we've all been to them as a bathroom. Yeah. And you turn that into a hostel type situation yeah. where there's bunk beds and, and then you take the bathrooms and you put some showers and you beef up that plumbing and infrastructure. That's not very expensive to do. But then heat and air conditioning is already the zoning doesn't allow. The zoning doesn't allow, doesn't allow it. Allow it. The neighbors don't like it. In the comprehensive plan. That's all right. Like but I'm just saying that that would be the least cost to get people under a roof. Right. For sure. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I guess so that's my question. So is there, is there a question like code compliance? The building code, code compliance, compliance building code compliance is zoning, a, a huge one, right? Because like obviously, so if you move people into an office building world, there's not going to be an egress window in every bedroom. Right. right? Don't have bedrooms. Don't have bedrooms, <laughs> right? So that's the thing. And I guess the, the question about, I had with vouchers, what kind of vouchers? Are you talking Section about? Section eight, sorry. Section eight vouchers. Yeah, but I mean, it's that's the a, next step, right? It's an incredibly finite pool. That's mm -hmm. my concern there too. I mean, I, 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 I used to, be, so I used to represent, you know, housing authority in Summit County and yeah. stuff like that. We ran out of Section eight money every year, and there was zero for transitional housing or anything like that. It was just yeah. generic Section eight, and that's part of the yeah. problem. Nobody wants to spend. Any money out of it outside of a few communities that are, you know, forward thinking, nobody else wants to spend a penny on it. I mean, yeah. that's that's where you go back to the 80s, it's where everything started, right? And it was all slashing budgets 80, 90 percent. So that's that's part of the conundrum to me is with all these things, yet you, you have to be willing to spend money. And I think it goes to what Paris and this is the thing that scares me about it, is that if if some communities are are spend the money and then other communities are just riding off their backs. I just don't see how local policy really ends up helping with the uh, the issue of on the house because yeah, it's got to be a homeless in Aurora. You can just right. go to Denver and get yourself a hotel room. And, right. I think and then it just keeps coming. And right? I did like think the, you're Aurora will send or the Aurora <laughs> PD will send them By there the literally, right? Well, and drop them off. Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, again, I, we could talk about these policies and Forever. realities all night, but I, the very question to me is, do we even want to address this issue? Oh, no. um, but uh, in terms of the cost, which is something that Karen's been harping on, um, yeah, it's super expensive to turn an office building to an apartment. You, know, you may as well build a new apartment building. And we don't have the hotels to convert. And Denver happens to have this area around the old Staple Airport that had a lot of hotels that suddenly were not so popular and that created a, uh, some opportunity. But we don't have that. When we have old hotels here, people tear them down and put up luxury student housing. Yes. Um, but I just love the bridge house model, which is more like 
who was talking about the hostels. Yeah, it's you know it's 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 like a hundred thousand dollars per person to do a full service building, but you sleep in a cot or a bunk bed, and you don't have an, you don't get an apartment, and it's transitional. And there is a quid pro quo of you know I'm going to not take drugs, and I'm going to get a job, or I'll be given a job. I'm going to pay some of that income toward you know it's just a really interesting model, but it's much less expensive than trying to build a, uh, a very low income uh, apartment building uh, full service. Um, and Paul is great. That's a great, so, the great uh, and then, uh, model. Doesn't work for all of the people that no, are. Oh, no, I know, I know. And, yeah, yeah. And, and think, but but maybe like yeah. I I recognize that like we've just had a robust conversation about various kinds of housing for people who are struggling with homelessness, and maybe that isn't the purview of HAB. But I do think that it would be very helpful for us to come up with some strategies of how can we build units that don't cost seven hundred thousand dollars right like it, can we maybe we make them smaller and maybe there's you know we should at least talk through how can you how can you reduce some of those costs because seven hundred thousand dollars a door it, it it, if, it's really I, hard to be affordable. I, I, if, it's if you can tell me, I'd love yeah. to know. Yeah, <laughs> it's code for there. Density right? is a part of it. Building, building code, is about to do it. zoning code, master plan, you know, code for variance. That's the only way, right? Because that's where all that cost comes from. So if you say, yeah, we're going to turn an office building into something that's more dormitory stock, we're going to have a communal kitchen. It's not going to meet. I mean, yeah, we, we always talk about the zoning code, master plan, whatever. You delve into the building code, that's remarkable, right? He can tell you. And and so really, if you want to have something, and that's something that I think, yeah, you know, I, I feel comfortable talking about that part because, you know, like you were saying, you know, there's a lot of bigger issues that deal, yeah. like I was just saying, you know, deal with federal funding and stuff. Right. But if you want to talk about that part of it and what policies we could have in place that could make these things. So when the opportunity comes along, because the other part is most commercial, most commercial property owners, they're they're the the last ones to realize their property is not as valuable as it used to be. So there's that other part of it too. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of people with big office buildings saying, "Hey, give me five hundred thousand and I'll give it to you." Right? But right. but if we have a policy in place that allows for code forbearance, allows for all these things, yeah. and even tries to figure out a way where yeah you, know, you can coax that commercial landowner into uh, donating that over because there's there's tax incentives or whatever else it is. Yeah. That's something that I think we can wrestle with and that you know, we can maybe come up with at least some good ideas. Mm -hmm. I feel comfortable talking about it from that perspective because yeah. it really is on the same continuum as housing, right? We need land, you need structures, you need buildings, and, and you need to come up with the fact that for, for cost-contained housing, it's just so expensive that you know we're we're you know trying to dig a uh, uh, trying to build a sandcastle in quicksand, right? So it's just even more exacerbated than it is in the normal local housing uh, arena where you're talking about people with something like you know 100 percent AMI, 80 percent AMI, and so you at least have some backfill. So here you're looking at you know probably almost down to a net zero, right? And you and what is that? And that's what I was saying. I, I love it if Section Eight was going to come. I don't know that it ever would, mm -hmm. but that's the thing to me. But we can talk about those policies, and if we talk about those policies, I think it's very resonant throughout all the different kinds of housing we're talking about. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely well within our purview, yeah. right? And I, I appreciate being an advisory board, right? right? Um, but I think that's something where we can say, hey, these are the things we wrestle with. It, it, it is all resonant. Yeah. So, well, I think you know, take care in your right, like yeah. the overall idea of whether it's unhoused folks or affordable or market rate or whatever. We have we have property in town that's not being used efficiently, mm -hmm. right? We have empty lots, we have empty office buildings, and so when we're talking about having that beautiful green area around, and so infilling, yes, infilling and density, but that doesn't necessarily mean building giant things in random neighborhoods. It could be. Instead of this office building, let's have a condo complex. Looks the same, feels the same, but it's actually used. <laughs> so I think if we come at it from that perspective, right. that's maybe, yeah. value. Maybe there's vacant lots that you put tiny homes on. That's like not a big construction. So it's like but, that article you shared from the New York Times, right? Yeah. Did you guys get to see that? That was a cool article, right. it's like rollovers and stuff like yeah. that. Well, tiny homes sort of don't make sense because if land is so valuable, you could maybe only build 
20 tiny homes versus like, or 10 tiny homes oh, versus so like 30 units if it was, if it went vertical. But if you could build 20, 10 tiny homes while they're getting the entire Settlements and the construction, and then you move those tiny homes the, somewhere else to another place. The difference, the, the, <laughs> yes, what you just said, but a tiny home or a, right here is twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, a thirty-unit right. condo complex is seven hundred thousand right. dollars. Right, right, right. Three right. 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 tall homes. Right. Tall homes. Like, so yeah, one of the questions I have with this, um, the the uh, modular construction that you're doing. Are, could they be smaller modules yeah. that could then be stacked so that they're not like 800 square foot single, no, like they, um, larger they modules? They could be smaller modules. You can see from that, right? Yeah, I mean, each box is basically 16 feet by 30, I think it's 32. So, I mean, it's roughly five to 600 square feet each okay. box. That's okay. skipping it to perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So, but the, don't get don't get too far ahead because we're those the modular factory production is really focused on Honduras. Um, you know the habitat project. So everybody's trying to like, oh, you could do it for my project. <laughs> so wait, what how long will it take to finish Honduras running first? Uh, it's going to take three to five years at least. Uh, okay. What did you say? Thirty-five. What is the modular? <laughs> Manufacturing plant. I'm going to be part of a, my staff update later. Oh, okay, oh, that's a good transition. Huh? Well, well, I, have, I have a comment actually. So you may you asked rhetorically earlier whether we're going to be um, a body that does innovative work and creates reports and researches stuff. And um, the th the thought that popped into my head when you when you said that was I remember when I applied going onto the HAB website and seeing that there was a report on tiny homes, uh, of all things. And I'm, I was just kind of curious if you felt like that was an effort that was worth doing. And then tiny homes came up. It makes me wonder if we should go and read what was written. Or were you, were you actually here when uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that was before? like my first I mean, meeting. Exactly. And, um, you know, it was it's really interesting report and I'm sure good ideas, but I would say low impact. Yeah, right. It was on, it wasn't about tiny homes. It was about tiny homes on wheels, which was allowing you as a homeowner to to oh. put utilities on your parking pad that would allow someone that owned a tiny home to pull it in there, rent the space. And you know, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, applicability of that is not very yeah. small. Yeah. Right, yeah. but as a conduit, so we had a, a listening session, and it was the most well-attended thing we ever had. Really? And that listening yeah. session was full of people who own tiny homes. And they're like, stop talking about tiny homes on a fixed foundation. Everybody owns tiny homes on wheels. We're tiny homes older, owners, we're tiny homes builders. And that was what that was what was the resounding feedback that we got. That's where Jacques kind of kind of rolled with that part, right? Because I, I had no clue. Right, I had no clue before then, and every single person is like, "Don't dismiss the wheel thing." That's what we have. That's part of the whole notion of the freedom. Of. So, which, which actually, yeah, um, kind of goes in line with what you guys were just talking about. Like, hey, while well, they're putting the permits together for the real building, let's and then, and then let's, we kind of yes. Yeah, but then, then what bit. happened was there was some city council planning board discussion about tiny homes on wheels that got nowhere. So we kind of said, "We never made it to them." So we never got there. No, I, I kept trying to push it and it's going anywhere, right? right. When, when you think the wheels, is it literally like a thing? car? No, it's where like they, a you can live or you can just books. like move? They're movable, trailer, like yeah. a trailer. Yeah. 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 If you go to a Folsom and, and Iris, you'll see one <laughs> <laughs> in the corner of the south, west corner of Folsom. I was just thinking about this. You know what that was? That's got wheels underneath that little skirt, and it's sitting out in front of it. Person's house. I lived on. I lived, I lived on the corner of Folsom and Iris. Yeah, that was a law school. Really? Yeah. It was, but anyways. It was, anyway, we're doing <laughs> the Yeah. So sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So here's like we're getting all these good data points and ideas out here, but where I'm coming from philosophically is, um, uh, you know, I keep on hearing. Uh, I think I've heard election official elected officials say we have a crisis in unhoused. Camping in public spaces, uh, it's an emergency. So, if this is an emergency, don't we need some emergency measures? Yes, like camping in like public spaces. The example of, like, <laughs> uh, you know, 
don't be so tight on all these codes. Let's let's get some buildings converted and not, not you know, maybe there's, I mean, I mean, you want to get people off the streets into heated buildings with running water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's as simple yes. as that. So uh, you know, you know, yoga pod did on that. So it's really bad. It's, it's a really bad scenario over on 30th and, and like Walnut over there, right? What's going on? Um, um, I, it's just a huge encampment there. Uh, like the Walgreens keeps getting broke into. Oh, really? For the, really? Oh, the, the Walgreens. The, door? The, the, the Walgreens has not had wood on the front of it <laughs> for like the last two years. But wow. so um, Yoga Pod's over there, what Yoga Pod did, and they're good people, right? And they're doing well. And so they, uh, they put, you know, they had they had a problem with with their facilities being used in bad ways or whatever. So they put, um, um, they got approval for it, and they put a whole bunch of um, porta uh, port out there, <laughs> which helps. Port I mean, but it helps. Yeah. yeah. So they put it out on the parking lot, and they had to jump through a lot of hoops to do it, but they did it, and it's helped. Right. That's There's great. a lot of people there. There. So it's just it's a pragmatic solution, right? Right. Nothing's ideal, but you know, it's that whole it's one of my favorite. Uh, Phrases, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and and it's probably in this scenario more than anything. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? Mm -hmm. So if there if there's an opportunity to off this building, who cares, right? You know, put up some put up some partitions, right. Car, right, or whatever. Just some real emergency zones. emergency zoning change. Yeah, and I'm right. also thinking about tiny homes. Uh, you know, what if there's publicly owned properties where you could put tiny homes for a while? They don't have to be there forever. Right. Yeah. Um, that takes that kind of land uh, basis out of the equation. Right. And then your costs are some utilities and putting these $20,000, you know, structures out for people to live in. So anyway, yeah. this yeah. is all spitballing yeah. conceptual, but I'm thinking... If it's an emergency, also, let's treat like yeah. an emergency and yeah. come up with some drastic. And I, and I agree. And maybe it's, I like to think of it as sort of like pilot programs, right? Like, let's try a 10 unit tiny home on a on a vacant lot where, where somebody's paying rent and whatever. And like, if it works, great. And if it doesn't, but like, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that we approve for the whole city forever and ever and ever. I don't know if that's easier. Or hard to no, I think that's, oh, that's, that's the it. way you do it. Because if it if it shows that it works, then terrific, right? Yeah. And then you actually, I, again, I said that whole thing. It's it's got it's going to have to be incremental, just like just like all kinds of uh, local towns, right? Yeah. 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 It's going to have to be incremental. Yeah. Curb demand, man. I mean, like yeah, I don't know. That's that's what I would. Well, maybe do all this and just people come. So I, I maybe the issue though, the issue though is well. So here's one of the things that okay, I'm I've seen data that shows there is a magnet effect. That a lot of the people who are camping aren't from Boulder. Oh yeah, they yeah. they came here, and part of it is because they can, and because other people say, "Hey, come to Boulder. You can get food. You can get services." Yep. So I do. I believe yep. there's a magnet effect. I agree. But I also believe that there are other communities that don't want to have a shelter and don't want to provide services because they're like, "Well, if we do that." We're going to turn into Boulder and Denver, and we don't want to turn into Boulder and Denver. Yeah. So if we can show in Boulder that some of these tiny home villages or these conversions of empty office buildings work, then it may create an incentive. If you own a vacant lot and you're not earning any money and somebody says, hey, I'll pay you 50 grand if you let me have a tiny home there, that you can then convince other communities to do it because it's being successful in Boulder. The huge thing with the Denver, but I'm optimistic. The huge pretty, thing with the Denver pretty, program is this. And this is what you, know, you have to you have to acknowledge and realize. So that Denver program, the the other side of that coin is that you know we're giving you an opportunity to place to stay. You can't stay here any longer, right? Yeah. yeah. And they've gotten beat the hell on that. Even I mean, I think I, I heard the uh, ACLU was going to sue. The city of Denver or something, but it's an effective program. And part of that saying, yeah, you know, you, you have to um as as a, as a the hotel. health, yeah. safety, and welfare issue, yeah. including for the people that are living there, we have to find a way to 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 properly address it. But that's the other part of it, too, right. right? Is that and and but that's the way you have community buy-in too, because it's like, okay, it's probably not a, a good idea for a lot of people to be living 
on the river or you know in the middle i mean i just thought of the soil last week right but and if, if, if you have a solution then you say here's the solution so this isn't an option anymore right right but that's part of it so my so issue so with the aclu yeah, suit right? is <laughs> that this concept of you can't ban camping unless there's an alternative place for people to go right. so let's use an extreme situation let's say there's 20,000 people that are camping in Boulder. We're never going to have 20,000 yeah. shelter units and shelter beds. So, and you're right, there's a lot of danger associated with people who are living in encampments, both to themselves and each other and the community. So I have an objection to the ACLU suit and it's not because I'm lack compassion, it's because I have compassion. So yeah, I think if you have, if yeah. Um, Sorry, the various, uh, <laughs> like, the various point, and I, I share that concern. Like, you don't want to be a magnet, but then you would probably be the one to answer this. But doesn't coordinated entry address that issue by sorting people out who are truly local from those who just came to get the free handout? Isn't that what it's supposed so to do? Somewhat true. Some of the coordinating, some of the resources that they have to that they, that people want to access, they only can if they have been it's like confirmed been in, within the city limits in a certain time or employed by or whatever so some of the services they do have a mechanism in place they but do have, you have to know though that a bunch of the people who are in encampments they're not going through coordinated entry they're okay. not they're not looking for, for assistance so they would if they were to wanted a, a cot or a tiny home or something yeah. so encampments are allowed or exist because they're allowed to exist Right. If if we had rules that say they're not allowed wherever they are, then they break them up. I see it all the time. I mean, so so you know, to what you're saying, if if we have an alternative, we say, look, you cannot encamp, you can't camp here, there, all the places they camp. Maybe you can go here, but you would provide that 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 pot or whatever it is, that bed. But then we have to ban all the other opportunities for encampments. Right. Are people willing to go that far? That's so, a big question. I have a lot to say about this subject okay. because I, I volunteer on the streets and I have some strong beliefs. But to go back to your original question, is this something that we want to tackle as a board? Yeah, it's housing. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Right. So whether we're whether we're looking really carefully at the missing middle or affordable housing. Or unhoused for yes, so yes, but then on our list. Tell me, I want to hear your thoughts on some of this since you've been like you've literally interviewed people on the streets. Yeah, I've done some of that too. I've, I've talked to people who've gotten off the streets. And no, if we when we we should choose how we want to dive into this. Okay. And then I can happily make arrangements for you guys to go do a street outreach shift with me. Super fun, really. Yes. Um, but I will say the one big thing that probably I'm different than a few of you anyway is the whole magnet concept. My personal belief is why would we not want to be known as a city that gives a shit about human beings? I'm all for that at some point. I also I also like when I imagine um when you're unhoused, mm. you're incredibly vulnerable. And the notion that you would just be like, oh, I heard Portland has better <laughs> services than Boulder. I'm going to I'm going to go there. I don't know. Like the, the, the magnet is a kind of a what it's a, to me, it feels it like does. a myth of like, it does. of I mean, like pe people is. imagine that what they would do if they knew about service. But, but like unhoused people are really vulnerable and they're not like um, they don't have like perfect information about. Sure. Way, the ways to optimize how they get yeah. services, you know, right? So, like, I, I'm trying to agree with you, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, um... no, I understand, I understand what you're saying. Uh, yes, that that is true. And there is some magnet stuff. There is some, hey, I hear we can get services over here. But there are, um, there's a, um, they call it a body count, and that sounds really horrible. So, they call, I call it a human count. So, they do a count annually. Yes, too. and they and there the information is out there, and so again, when we kind of choose to dive into this, we can pull some of that information, and then we'd have some good data to actually talk about. There was actually a point in time count done yesterday. Yeah, I was going to say it was. Was it yesterday? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, so I think it is an extra one every year. They yeah. we do an additional one in the summer. Um, the required one is the one that was the one in the winter. <laughs> and then Boulder right. has so I understand what that means. They go out and count how many people are living out on the street. Mm -hmm. What's the number? And do you I think don't know yesterday's number? Well, not yesterday's, but in general. There's a dashboard. I just pulled it up. Um, and there's some statistics about like how long they've been here and how old they are and are they employed and hmm. are they yeah. here or where are they from? I'd be curious just to know the raw number. Um, so looking at number years seven. past. Years past. Um, let's see. There has been an increase. I believe it. But not necessarily from. I don't know if we're reading. Something in the 850 range. Yeah, that's what I want to say. 800, no. um, the easiest one that I pulled up was okay. interactions, mm -hmm. uh, unique interactions. There was 739. Uh, mm -hmm. On the streets every night in Boulder proper. That was uh, county. Point in time last year. Last year, just that day. For the county? For the for city. city. City, I think that's what there is. There's a dashboard that you on the city of Boulder website that you can go and look at all the data for that. And actually, if you're really interested, on February 8th, there's a study session with the, with the, with the city will be presenting all of their homelessness strategies and updates. So that's something that's really important. I'm sorry. If you guys really want to go down this road and dip your toe into this issue, <laughs> you need to go to the February 8th city council meeting. On my calendar, I would say it's a requirement. Huh? It's yeah. study session, so it'll be virtual. Uh -huh. that, but I would go in person because it's super easy to tune it out when you're watching it online. Session. Study sessions, I don't really, they have in person yet. So, so I, 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 I would agree that we should focus on housing. Middle, missing middle, how do we, what can we do to make every new construction unit less expensive? Mm -hmm. What can we do to house people in empty buildings? But I think if we only focus on the unhoused, it's going to be a, I think, I, I don't think we should only focus on the unhoused. No, absolutely. Great. No, no. Great. I do think it's the biggest problem. Three items on the list. Mm -hmm. um, when you, when you say, um, um, ideas about how to make housing less expensive. I do you mean like construction costs? And when you say that, do you have specific ideas in your mind that you want to bring up at some future meeting? Or are you just kind of it's just kind of out there as a vague? Um, so so I um, I think there's I don't think there's a single solution. I think there's multiple solutions. So like okay, can we figure out ways to create more units that are smaller, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think it's so much the construction because the cost of building an affordable housing is roughly the same as the cost of building a luxury house. Um, but I do think that there's all these, well, I don't know, granite countertops well, it's versus- it's it's the the needle Right, right. Well, but yeah. I do think that like, whether it's the time that it takes to build or the, or the, the fees and the permitting and the, mm -hmm. I think it's it's looking at all of the costs to to to, to develop, not to necessarily to construct, but all of the right. stuff to develop. We're to buy a home differently, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. So I'll tell you. So I represent Copper Mountain. So years ago, we took the old Club Med, which used to be, <laughs> and, and nobody wanted to go anywhere. Um, so we put it employee housing, and we had, uh, and we had to get all these different, you know, each PV modifications and everything like that. But in, in these little club bedrooms, right, uh, allow two, three, sometimes employees to be able to live in them. And they all loved it, right? Especially when they were younger and they loved it. It was fun. They had, and then we had a huge common area. So it's that same kind of notion yeah. as a hostel, yeah. dormitory style, whatever it is. Um, but it, it really helped make sure, because, you know, we had a policy and we still do today, trying to have every employee who needs a place to live have some way to accommodate them, right? Um, and, and we looked over everything in the last few years, including buying old hotels and yeah. Leadville, whatever else, so expensive over there. But you know, that was one of the things where, you know, it does work and you need some some uh, flexibility in building codes, zoning codes, et cetera. That's the key. And then you can make that work. And, mm -hmm. and for a lot of people, and there's some people that are gonna say, 
leave me alone, right? right? But for the people that don't, if, if you give them an opportunity, it's something that's there. And I think that that's what I was saying too, is that, you know, I, I, I really think it's a bad idea because I was here when we kind of fell down that road back in like 2020 and then it kind of blasted back at us and the council wasn't happy with us. But I think that, uh, you know, the whole notion of saying that housing and everything we do, whether it be missing middle, whether it be transitional, it's a continuum, right? And a lot of those notions or policies that we can wrestle with are within that continuum, mm -hmm. then it's worthwhile addressing because there's probably you know, mm -hmm. spillover from one thing to the other to the right. other, right? Mm -hmm. Tiny homes, right? So you say, okay, it could be on wheels, it could be this, it could be that. So I think I think mm -hmm. from that perspective, it's something that does make it easier for us to. And a lot of the things that I've been reading too is that we're missing the SROs, right? Like yeah. the single room occupancy, whether, and I don't think they have their own bathrooms or kitchens. I think it was more like, you have a bed, you have like a television, you can lock the door um, and it, it's affordable. It may not be ideal for lots of people. And some people might prefer more that communal hangout with people. But there's some people who are like, I want my own space. I don't yeah. want to be with anybody else. It should be and option. being, yeah, it, exactly. Let's let's mm -hmm. let's promote a variety of housing options. And SROs are basically coded out, right? Mm -hmm. Because so, of updating building codes, SROs, and a lot of other reasons to do it. No, would that be considered like the co the co-ops that then got coded back? Kind of. In in 27. But I think uh, another term or the more modern term is just micro units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's much more sellable, particularly for yeah, people. Right. But when you think of micro units, do they have their own bathroom and kitchen? They will off. I mean, a lot of people want their own bathroom. Yeah. Um, but they don't have a full kitchen. And it's they're typically very small spaces, but it's highly amenitized. So okay. there is a larger kitchen area, and it's usually a roof space. We, I remember having conversations with developers over the years um, who were interested in doing micro units because they thought there would be a market for it. Um, but most of them haven't come to fruition. I think the one on Pearl is the closest. Is that happening? Yeah. Is that making, it's yes. not under construction, is it? I think mean, it's pretty close, isn't it? I don't know. It's well, huge in the Northwest. It's but it's their yeah, target market. Yeah. So, yeah. When you say highly amenitized, then that target That's market right. might not be the SRO to no. Mm -hmm. no, but new construction is not going to be affordable to yeah. anybody. Which so is where can... we get into that. What can we and do to enhance the office building? Put some costs. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I, 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 right. so I want to go back to my original point. And, um, <laughs> I tried to get is, you back. <laughs> which is, uh, I totally agree with what he just said. Uh, and, and that is, we are yeah. having words to address all kinds of allergies. And I want to get back to also my caveat that I don't want to see us falling on a sword of like arguing about camping or yeah. harm reduction sites yeah. and social service. You know, like we just. Yeah, I agree. I totally so, agree. Let's just say so, we're a housing board. Let, every, let someone else figure out mental health and right. all these really hard issues. We want to see more housing for the full spectrum of people that need housing. Yeah. Yes. And, I have a I comment. I know. Uh, I, I agree. I, I have a comment I want to make. It's it's, it's burning in my in my mouth here. Um, uh, or wherever it burns, you know. I'm not sure. It must have come out, you know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, another source of another way of looking at vacancy in the city. One is commercial buildings, but um, I did some analysis with the census data about a year ago to estimate the number of empty bedrooms in Boulder. And uh, it's about 30,000 according to conservative estimates. That I, in, I have a whole blog post that details how I put that number together. Um, I think that, um, I don't know how an advisory board can speak to that, but to me, it's like, if you were looking at the earth from high above and looking down at the situation and you saw that People were living out on the streets while other people have five to six bedrooms per person. Um, it's a weird, it's a weird situ, it's a weird society that we've created with a lot of inequity. Um, and the fact that there's all these empty bedrooms around Boulder that are already climate controlled, move-in ready, available tonight. Um, it's like we just there, there's an aspect of like social change where we've normalized. I mean, there's actually like a thing where like 
if you're an adult and um, and I'm quoting somebody else lo loosely, if you're an adult and you're not in a romantic relationship or you're not living with family, you are expected to live alone. Like that's a that's a social norm that that we've established. And it's it's just a that butts up against um, our housing realities. And and yeah, we just have a ton of empty housing sitting around. It's all it's all accounted for in terms of ownership and who who can who controls it. But um, anyways, I don't know if there's discussion to be had around that or ways of well, well, thinking you know, about. So <laughs> you know, what happened what what I'm sorry. Things <laughs> happened last year, and I can see. Yeah. Um, right. So it's, it doesn't really get to that big issue. So the question is, how do you get the people that own to those bedrooms to share them? Like, what's the incentive? For them yeah. To do? Yeah. Well, there's. It's a great idea, but I think there's the the, the biggest issue there is a lot of people are aging in place, right? Of course, mm -hmm. the baby boomers are retirement age. Kids are going whatever. They still have their same houses. They can't sell that house to downsize because interest rates and this and that, they end up with not as good a place for more money. So they're sitting there going, I love my house. I, I like my four bedrooms. I'm going to stay here as long as I can. But there's four empty bedrooms for two people. Living. It's still an elephant in the room. You know, True, I, I don't know that, like, it, like that's me, right? And I, don't know <laughs> that I, I don't know that I would want some complete stranger who's potentially having mental health issues I'm not to be like, about, living I'm not, in my house. I'm not house. talking about homelessness. I'm just, just talking bedrooms. about. I'm just talking about the fact that we have a lot of empty bedrooms. Yeah. Doesn't you can you can you can put what I mean. There's there's actually really good tools for, for figuring out how to find good matches for uh, housemates. Roommates.com. So, mm -hmm. um, it's actually called sharing okay. housing. Uh, uh, yeah. We all like tea. We all. Okay. okay. So, so uh, do you need someone to do yard work? I mean. <laughs> So it's 8.30, and I always want to end our meetings on time. And really what I wanted to get out of this, see if you agree, is some or some consensus could be a head nod that these are the three odds areas of housing. Can you do this real quick? What are the three? Well, the first one was, uh, I forgot, missing metal. But <laughs> yes. The second one is, um, really kind of gets to Karen's issue of cost reduction and how can we make housing more affordable in general. Uh, and then the third is um, creating more uh, housing for people who are currently housed, whether that's transitional or permanent. But housing and structures with heat and running water and bathrooms, not necessarily tents. I, I mean, I, I think we, Going back to even November, right? We've been kind of wrestling with that, and I think I think we we, we built some decent consensus on those three issues beforehand, and uh, so head nod. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, great. Um, well, I'll come up with a plan to discuss the seats and individually in future meetings, and see if those lead to some recommendations. Um, it would be great to get more research under our belts on some of these issues. And I don't know how we get that we're not like staff. So the last day to do it, not worth no, it's good. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you think of our three ideas? They're fantastic. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, I <don't> know, <laughs> are, they oh, are they too big, too broad? Um, I and my my overall just critique is I think they could benefit from being thought through a little bit. Um, I think it's just really easy to throw out solutions. Yeah. Um, and if they're not well thought out, uh, I think it's going to impact how they're received. So that's my advice. So that's what we're doing that's what you're doing, but I think you need to do more. So in theory, I, could we could we say to city council these are the three priorities, and over the next year we're going to delve deeper into what we think that you know ideas are, or do you think we have to have all that figured out by the time? No, you don't have to have it figured out, and I think it's written well. We basically say, please, we think we should explore these ideas. Yeah. Um, but I think if they see an idea that they're like, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. 
then it's going to, they're going to tune up potentially. Mm -hmm. anyway. So to, you... it would be better to present these in generality. Potentially, yeah. Uh, we maybe not get into the level of detail, um, but it's up to you guys. Right, but they don't want a letter from us, so how do we present it? Skywriting? Well, they might. They don't want a letter yet. Yeah. All right, they don't want a letter yet. So in the past, council, I don't know when, but in the past, yes. so just go to council, council has before letters done more assignments like this like this is what you we think you should be working on that was the they, first they've never done that with yeah. ab no no oh i thought they did um, okay. what if we at least mostly anybody else went and did a public comment and say on behalf of have you know we're having this is what we're thinking about this year yeah. thanks for listening yeah i think the letter is a better way i i always feel like so a lot of times you just do the pop in public comment, then you know, I mean it's just kind of it, it puts it puts the 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 body holding that meeting kind of, you know, um, because they're really not even supposed to talk about it, right? So the letter's a good way and say, hey, we'd love to come give and sit down and do a joint session, whatever else. But you know, the letter's a good way to go about it. They can read it, they can discuss it any way they want. Again, we're not kind of um forcing the issue in the in the public comment section where they can't really even decide to engage in something like that. And it, and it's just, you know, they have other things going on. That's that's my right. take. But um yeah, Karen. Is it also a consideration that um like each one of us like sit down with one of the city council members and um like, you know I've said many friendly meetings yeah. about the city council members and like, why not would that help to meet? give direction or choose direction? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the whole point, right? You're, you're trying to influence council's work plan for the next two years. Right. So right. So, that, so keep there are two separate things. There's HAB's work plan and then there's council's work plan. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about giving very specific, well thought out things, it's for things you want council to focus on. Mm -hmm. The stuff that you guys want to focus on, you can be as vague as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I'm hearing terms of written communications is go back to the original idea of having a short letter yeah. that presents concepts without getting into it so much detail, uh, which is more easy for them to absorb and less uh, uh, makes it more difficult to just be dismissive. That won't work, you know, because you've gotten too deep in the weeds of policy. Yeah. Okay. And also keep in mind, um, council may, the, the committee, for the retreat planning may have specific questions that they want you to ask, answer, remember in the past? Yeah. So 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 so. After the retreat? Yeah. No, for, sure. as sure. part of the letter for the retreat. Okay. So again, I, I was trying to get you guys to send a letter back in December so I could preempt all of that, but, but we were didn't work out. Too lazy. You guys, you were too thorough, that's all. Right. Too exacting. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I, um, I, I need to think more about this. I can come up with some proposals for how we're going to handle uh, developing and communicating these ideas. And uh, I'd actually like to move on to manage that. It's okay with them. Save 40. Um, yeah. Great. So I just have a couple. Of, so if there's anything you guys do want to, Hear about? Please let me know. But I was going to give you just a quick update on the modular factory. I did want to follow up just on um, the February eighth meeting. So I hope everybody wrote that down. Mm -hmm. that okay, perfect. Because February eighth is the homelessness update right. from staff to city council. So I would highly recommend. What time? It's yeah. six o'clock. Would be recorded. I have a conflict. Yes. It will be recorded. Okay. Yeah. Can you attend that one in person? Um, Tiffany's saying that the I, study I, sessions are still to do. Still, I, know. I can't pull anything up. Okay. Anything. Anyway, um, I'll let you know if you can attend in person or not. But you can't speak anyway. Because, right. right. Um, but I think it it's just more powerful to be there. But if you can, I'm on the positive study session. Yeah. Virtual. Um, the other piece of that, you know, so and I've talked to. 
Kurt, our director, about this. You know, he he's not certainly not opposed to you guys um, getting um, delving into this issue, um, and he's happy to pr help provide staff support so we can have our um, uh, staff with the expertise in this area come and explain more about the current programs that the city offers. Um, just so because I think it's important, you know, it's so easy to just talk in generalities about this stuff. Um, but I think not everybody has the same level of knowledge and understanding. So it might help to have that basis. So February 8th is the first opportunity. Um, if you guys want to delve into specific topics, just let me know and I can coordinate that for future meetings. Sound good? No, thank you. Um, the other thing related to that, um, I have, have I firmly believe that um, unhoused issue and addiction are inextricably linked. So if um, there's a great book that I just finished, um, The Least Among Us by Sam Kionis, I would highly recommend it just to understand because the people that you visibly see out, um, you know, camping in our public spaces, those are the people that are the hardest to serve. The least among us. The least among us. He wrote a great book about um, the opioid addiction or crisis mm -hmm. and the origins of that. And he basically recycles back there. He basically refers back to that history. And as part of it. Sam Kionis is, I think, Q-U-I-N-N-O. Yeah, something like that. Do you remember? Sounds about right. Okay, thank you. On that one, there's another really good book called Poverty by America that I just finished. I read that. That's really good. Um, yeah, so that's it about that. Modular factory. So um, this is exciting. So has anybody been out to the school district property, seen anything? Um, next time you're out there, just stop in the parking lot, take a look. You, the um, foundation walls have been completed. Uh, the, the metal building is starting to go up. So next time you're out, if you go out South there. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically 65th, you just mm -hmm. take that road to the back of the site and you can't miss it. And who will be the employees that are there? Like, is it a yeah. student, like inter, like training? So, um, yeah, it's, I think other, some people are more familiar with it than others. So this is a partnership between um, the city, Flatirons Habitat for Humanity, uh, and the school district. Mm -hmm. So the school district is providing the land um, with the understanding that they are going to be able to provide work, workforce training for their students in the construction trades program in the factory. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, they're going to understand uh, construction processes as well as learning specific potentially learning specific trades as well um and this way they don't have to go you know across the county to, to a build site they can walk two minutes to the factory um and then hopefully producing you know workforce for future factories as well habitat is going to own and operate the factory itself so they're the certified operator um, they're going to ones that are going to coordinate uh, volunteer efforts. So it's still based largely based on volunteer labor, um, donated materials, uh, lower cost materials from various suppliers. Uh, and then um, the city is basically paying for it all and managing, well, I'm managing the construction of the building. So um, yeah, so the idea is so cool. so July is when the factory will be complete. Um, but then there's, you know, it's going to take us several months to fully equip the factory and then to start producing units. Um, and there are lots of processes that you have to get into place. You know, we have to get certification from the state um, to operate a modular factory because the city doesn't permit these zones. It's the state that permits them. Um, Could we schedule a tour? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah once great. once we basically have a floor and yeah. wall. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. So, so right you know, it's a big mud pit. It's sixteen by thirty-two is the average oh, uh, yeah. unit roughly. And how many? And they have a kitchen, bathroom, shower, everything in there. Mm -hmm. How many of those can be made out of that factory in a week, year, month, year? Like? So it has the capacity for fifty. Per year. 
Yeah, one a week. Um, one a week, roughly. But Habitat is not confident that they're going to be able to get that get there because they have to rely on volunteer labor mostly mm -hmm. and we have students learning which is going to slow the process down as well even if you get half that's not bad yeah so their goal is is basically um at least once a month mm -hmm. one a month and is all for ponderosa or will it just keep going as it'll keep going once uh, if there's a lull in the demand for ponderosa because basically when ponderosa we're not displacing anybody it's only if you want to move into a fixed foundation home um people can stay in their mobile homes until they die basically so what's the cost but for the each building or for the typical unit um right now we're we are optimistic it's going to be a, a 120 dollars a square foot so we're talking about 60 grand wow yeah so the the thing about modular is uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's not a huge reduction in cost. It's it's really ten to twenty percent of the overall cost, um, which is it doesn't include land. Yeah, or right. foundation. Exactly, or foundation, foundation. Um, utilities, or so there's things, but still, that's that's pretty inexpensive. Yeah, it is, and largely it's because it's volunteer labor and sweat equity. Right. Too. So you remember the the future residents have to help build these too. Mm -hmm. So does that count the site work? I'm at 120 now. No, that's just the just four mills of record. Um, so cheaper than 700,000 a unit. A little bit, a little bit. And um, you know, basically what we're what we're proposing are four boxes that are in a duplex, two-story duplex. Nice. So kitchen on the ground floor, living room, and then up above three bedrooms. Um typically one. How many potential to Ponderosa handle? How many potential units? 73. So it could be a lot for Ponderosa. Mm, they're not all modular, so. Oh, I see. There's some stick built. There are 12 units in phase one that are stick built currently. Well, we saw them over there with the habitat ones. On the tour of Michael Black. Sounds great. Let's yeah. build them, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. Thank Let's you. Thank you. That's great. That's that whole point. You got to try. It goes to try to start <laughs> doing things, right? It's right. like, oh, it's not my answer. It's like, got to get away from paralysis by analysis, man. Yeah. Sometimes you just Several answers. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Anything else you want that's going on with the city that you guys are curious about? Or oh, we don't want to What's the uh, building the schedule for next year for next door? Oh, yeah. Alpine Balsam is making great progress. Um, it's in for form based code review with the city. Uh, I think they're finalizing some designs for 11th Street, the new 11th Street. Uh, and basically, I think we are close to getting the infrastructure plans fully approved by the city. And um, that so, and the goal is to start that work uh, in 2025. Start constructing. Start constructing. Start the infrastructure. Um, so it will probably be mid twenty twenty five would be my guess. Um, but the so the the greenway is really what it has delayed us a little bit because you know you have to go. There are some design issues that we had to work through, but getting through the Clomer and the Lomer through FEMA mm -hmm. has been um, you know it's, I don't know if you don't know, but it's super time consuming. Oh, it's wonderful fun. Yeah. But the, the great news is it's going to be a, a you know really nice amenity for the community. It's, the design is is really quite it's quite beautiful. That's in the floodplain. Uh, okay, so floodplain. currently, and so it was eleventh, uh, mm. and most of Balsam. So that's the, 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 the design. The design's not available yet for general. It's not on the internet. You can just go look at it yet. Mm, no. But I can I can show you on my laptop. So uh, I got a question. Not sure there you can answer, but I'll try it. Sure. Um, so my understanding of the city city's facilities master plan, one of the ideas embedded in there is that the city has some surplus properties. They want to sell them, I think presumably for market value, and somehow that money will be is needed and will be directed towards Alpine Balsam. And that's all I know. So tell me more. 
<laughs> so the price tag for Alpine balsam is quite astronomical. Uh, give us a number. Later. Okay. Well, it's well, 50 million about that. Right? It's more than 50 million. No, no, the final land. Uh, and then to demo all that stuff with all the asbestos, that's very expensive. And then to put the infrastructure in. And that's as far as the city's going, right? No. Um, oh, the well, building the office buildings. Yeah. So repurposing the civilian building into yeah. city offices. Yeah. Because the rest is going to be privatized, isn't it? Um, no, well, two parcels are going to Boulder Housing Partners to build uh, affordable housing. Sort of privatized. Sort of. <laughs> One parcel will be sold market. Privatized. The north uh, western corner um, will be, I think it's like 20 townhomes yeah. for sale, uh, self-parked. And then the parcel at um, Balsam and uh, Broadway, we, we haven't quite figured out, but it's basically it could be for sale or it could be rental, depending. Um, we obviously we would like to try to get some ownership opportunities if we can, um, but we may may not be able to do that. Similar to the challenges we had at um, thirty per. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's basically the market is driving rentals. Yeah. Home ownership is just yeah. so expensive, like we've been talking about. So following up my question, so the city needs money for. Infrastructure, greenway, everything, every construction. Yes. And which buildings will they, the city be selling? Um, you know, I could not tell you for sure without going back to the plan. Um, I, I mean, part of the challenge, I mean, two of the buildings, New Britain and the Atrium, or not the Atrium, Park Central, um, Park Central are supposed to be demolished, right? Because they're in the hazard. Um, Age Well West is also partially in the high hazard, so relocating all of those services um, to the Western City campus as well. But like we own property on Spruce Street, that's a you know single story concrete building. And then others, I, I don't know, I, I I can't tell you specifically which ones. So I don't think the memo even specified which. Right? Did that? Did it? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. I've seen a list somewhere, but maybe it's informal. Uh, and then are there any other updates on 30 Pearl? It's all the market rate portion is what's going up now, right? Yeah, I just drove by the other day. It's pretty, that's pretty interesting. interesting. Okay. For rent or for sale townhomes? It's all rental. Um, we tried to get uh, ownership. So basically, they said, as a compromise, they said we will uh, rent for the first seven years and then consider converting it to condos. Yeah. That's okay. Now we can talk about dark horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, any other questions for Jay or other updates? Hey, um, thank you. Uh, meeting debrief, uh, good meeting. Thank you, everyone. Great to have a full house. Uh, we approved our minutes. We had one public comment. We heard a really good uh, presentation and conversation with Christopher Johnson that helped us understand the Boulder Valley comprehensive plan update process. We had an innovative legal interpretation of the nature of the document from <laughs> our land use attorney here. Um, um about the airport <laughs> update and the possibility of um, making a recommendation to council uh the timing i'm sure but uh, possibly asking them to keep housing on the table as they consider the future of the airport um we had a great conversation about uh abs uh, priorities for 2024 and how we might present those to council uh, that's to be continued uh, next month, um, and they go, Matt and I, I will come up with some kind of a framework to structure that yeah. conversation. Uh, Jay, uh, Madison staff, Jay, you give us a great update about um, Alpine Balsam and the manufactured housing uh, facility, which we will tour someday when it's vertical, uh, and where those houses will go, what they cost. Um, and our next meeting is, oh, and very important that we all attend or listen to the February 8th council meeting. 
which is a presentation on, uh, on how issues and policies, um, which will inform our conversation for one of our priorities on addressing that area of the housing puzzle. Um, yeah, I think that's everything we did. Um, we had no uh, voting uh, items this month, but we uh, we have some very big issues ahead. We'll that was maybe weighing in on some, some of those issues. And our next meeting is when? February 28th. February 28th, fourth Wednesday, always. February 28th. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Just a reminder, people have five more days to apply to be oh, a board that's member. Right. That's right. Do we know if any applications are in the can? I haven't gotten a list yet. Usually, or they. I applied today. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I did some. I did some. Outreach. You applied for a planning board. No. <laughs> I did some outreach to folks I thought would be good members. That some of them may apply. I encourage you to reach out to colleagues uh, along those lines. And if we the chance we lose our housing developer on the the board would be great to have another person. Half decade, man. <laughs> I have a comment. Only half. <laughs> I, have a, I have a comment. Um, there's an event on Friday called Housing for Homies, which is a um, fundraiser uh, entertainment extravaganza uh, hosted by a good friend of mine, Ren Da. Uh, and so that's that's Friday. I believe it's at the Junkyard Social. Uh, so oh, cool. I, sent an, I sent an email just now with the details. Okay, so thank you. consider going to that if you're interested. Entertainment. Um, remind me of that. No. Oh, I'm attending a housing summit on Monday uh, at the Boulder JCC that I think is a regional um, group think on uh, innovative housing solutions. So I'll be able to report on that um, next month, or maybe I'll just write a right, tool we'll right up a bit of December. And you'll be there, right? Oh, yeah. I'll ski in. I don't think I've seen the agenda yet. Yeah. Do they have an agenda? There is an agenda. Um, I can send it to you. Uh, I, see it. I RSVP'd and I got a very general generic. Yeah. Like you're going to show up, but not going to be done before. But there's some breakout sessions. So this is organized by Boulder County um, on behalf of the Regional Housing Partnership. So it's it's by invite only. Michael is special because he's the chair. So that's the perk of being chair. You get to go to more meetings. <laughs> so, um, but it's all of the all three commissioners will be there. Um, hopefully most of our city council will be there and all the other jurisdictions leadership will also be there. We did it back in 2017, which was the precursor to um, the region adopting the regional strategy of, and the 12% goal. But permanently affordable. So this is kind of a check-in to say this is the progress we've made. We've achieved a lot of the um, things that we laid out in that 2017 plan. Um, what's next? Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. All not in favor. <laughs> okay, the best. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Great meeting. Hope you feel better. Thank you. Me too. See you next month.